Plus, Hail Mary. We're hitting the field with a beloved member of the Baltimore Ravens. They would literally come up and some of them would ask for prayer personally. And so it's a, it's a right special time. Right here on time. the field. Yeah, yeah, right here as I'm coming around. How their team chaplain links football and faith on and off the field. And pit stop. You are so much younger. Brad Pitt, a real-life Benjamin Button, is turning 60, and we're talking about it. You do not talk about Fight Club. A look back at his life and incredible career coming up in Pop Start today, Monday, December 18th, 2023. devotion out there in the rain, the wind, uh, and just happy as clams out there in their orange ponchos. We're back 8-12 with a story tied to our toy drive spectacular that will definitely warm your heart. And a reminder, there's still time for you to help the drive. You can scan the QR code on the screen for the details. Mm -hmm. This morning, we are honoring a therapy dog working closely with children with autism. And NBC's Sam Brock helped bring those kids and that special mm -hmm. dog some real holiday cheer, huh, Sam? Craig, Savannah, Hoda, good morning. Look, we all know the powerful connection of animals in our own lives. And talking about that holiday cheer, Craig, we're about to introduce you to a dog named Eliza. Eliza is a six-year-old Labrador retriever just outside of Atlanta, and she is not just any kind of dog. When she shows up, guys, at the Autism Therapy Center there, she's able to really just connect and allow kids to thrive in their everyday lives. So when the online pet supply store, Chewy, told us about their campaign involving Eliza, we knew we had to do something to make this holiday season. Perfects. Whether it's a warm hug or a slobbery kiss, <laughs> when Eliza the therapy dog joins the party, it's puppy. joyful chaos. Puppy! Puppy! That's green! That's green too! Everyone wants to say hello to their four legged best friend. As for me, well, I'm kind of just in the way. Hey, bud, how you doing? <laughs> Welcome to the party. And honestly, who can blame these four and five year olds? That's up your face. Eliza's patience, honorable. As she reports for duty at Hope Bridge Autism Therapy Center in Georgia, just one of many clinics designed to help children nationwide with autism, often in underserved communities. Eliza's job is to assist the kids with activities that teach them life skills, like counting. How many toes does Eliza have? One, two, three. So she's got five toes on her paw. All of it working towards school readiness. We want these kids to be independent. Donna Bryan is Eliza's owner and a former therapist at the clinic. She left to pursue her master's in social work. A lot of these kids are really struggling with communicating their needs. Well, Eliza doesn't need to communicate. You don't have to explain anything to her. She is just right there. She's going to meet you wherever you are. Can you show Eliza your tongue? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Are you seeing them become more verbal, even without having to communicate with Eliza? Absolutely. Absolutely. We might not necessarily understand exactly what it is that they're saying, but you know what? She does. <laughs> and she's going she's gonna to respond in, in only a way she can. One of those children is four-year-old Annika Gonzalez. In less than a year, she hit a communication milestone. When she was diagnosed with autism, she was considered nonverbal. To be honest, when she was diagnosed, I never thought I would hear her say, Mom, or I love you. But now, Annika can form complete sentences. Her mother, Kimberly, says thanks, in part, to Eliza's helping paw. When she's with Eliza, she feels a sense of security. Mm. She feels happiness and joy. Hi. Hi. Yes. <laughs> I love you. I love you. Okay. <laughs> 
That kind of progress is something worth celebrating. So in honor of Eliza, anyone want to go to a party? Yeah! yeah, let's do it. So Chewy threw you a holiday party. Look at all these presents. Annika, what is this? What is this? Eliza, can I have your help with this, please? And there was one more surprise left in store for our guest of honor. Chewy likes to celebrate deserving animals like Eliza. This year, they would like to donate $20,000 to Blue Path Service Dogs so that there can be so many more Elizas out there. Wow. Oh my goodness, you guys have no idea the impact this is gonna make on so many families. Here's to more Elizas. <laughs> And guys, a bit of background on Eliza. Donna told us originally she was trained to be a guide dog, however, had a food allergy. So Eliza had a career change and channeled her incredible spirit for therapy. Speaking of a personal dose of love here, this is my friend Oreo, oh. or Oreo. Oreo, if your wife is from South America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oreo is only about two months old right oh. now, guys. And so if you're wondering, like, can my pet be a therapy animal? There's a few attributes the AKC says is very, very important. One of them, they have to be calm so a ball of energy that might be fun around the house but it's not good for mm -hmm. therapy they have to love all people and then not be easily spooked or unsettled so speaking of which if you could believe in the brock household this is one of two animals that's about a six pound ball of fur the other one is coco loco coco loco is so crazy he will never qualify to be a therapy dog so he's not here today oh. but in his stead we have oreo and me and, and two pomeranians running around our house oh my uh, gosh a little bit of background that. on me too Sam we really like diverted the... into yeah. a different course nobody saw that coming no tell us more about those dogs what if coco loco's watching no. i feel bad yeah. now oh. I well you did name it coco loco savannah so combined weight yeah combined weight of 10 pounds and the second that coco loco sees me he just gets furious yeah. every single time so wow. i'm still wow. trying to figure that one out maybe because you named him Coco. I was yeah. gonna say. You know? Thank you, Sam. Don't Thank you, Audio. Every morning, get into the holiday spirit with today. We're going to spread some holiday cheer. Some added inspiration to give back this holiday season. We are launching today's toy drive. Holiday gifts for everybody on the list. That is delicious. Our biggest holiday crowd I'm yet. Three, two, one. Make today your home for the holidays. We are back. 8.36. Mandy Moore is here. After wrapping up her Golden Globe nominated run on NBC's This Is Us last year, she is making a return to TV starring in season two of Peacock's thrilling drama, 
It's called Dr. Death. It's based on a true story. Mandy plays an investigative journalist who falls into a whirlwind romance with a surgeon only to realize she would be uncovering more about him than she ever would have imagined. I've been trying to get an angle on this medical piece for a TV special I'm producing. Generational medicine? Regenerative medicine. Sure. I read this piece in the Times about this little girl who needs a new windpipe and her family's working with this doctor in Europe who's developing artificial organs. Medical miracles. Yeah. I hate that word, miracle. I don't hate this guy. That's the doctor. He's actually got a pretty impressive CV. He's worked all around the world, published in The Lancet, research grants out of Karolinska. It's where they give out the Nobel Prize. Mandy, good morning. Good morning. Hey, Mandy. You noticed your backdrop. I mean, this one clip is a true, based on a true story. Based on a true story. About an NBC producer. Hoda, you've yeah. actually knew, knew her for years. Yeah, Benita Noel worked here at NBC yeah. for many, many years. So you're playing her role and how she kind of gets duped. Yeah, so season two is all about, it sort of follows the, the parallel oh tracks God. of this doctor and sort of oh, his best. nefarious ways with his patients. But he used those same oh, tactics on, on this woman as well. And she ends up falling in love with him and crossing those like ethical boundaries and well I think a the funny thing is uh, when you think about a journalist who's tr who's prone to look for things that aren't true prone sure. to, but this guy was so good yeah. that he was able to dupe even her clearly a sociopath and a pathological narcissist mm -hmm. and like I said he was able to sort of use those same tactics to get his patients to trust him which is what is ultimately so terrifying. It's fascinating. There was a podcast about mm -hmm. this case. Yeah. There's a Netflix documentary about this case. Mm -hmm. And now it's being dramatized. How, what was it like to kind of bring this to life? And you had a ton of source material. We had a ton of source material. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting playing a real life person. And hopefully she's able to see the series. And there's some sort of resolve. Because I think there's such vulnerability in sharing her story, which ultimately helped lead to like Paolo, Dr. Macchiarini, being held accountable for his actions. Yeah. All right. Can we talk about the other part of your life, which yeah. we love so much. Mandy, the mom. Uh, uh, how, so how, how is so it? Awesome. You got, your youngest is a little about around one, one year old, right? Yes. So what's yeah. it like being a mom of two? I mean, it's crazy. Two, two boys, oh. mom of boys. <laughs> oh, they're so squishy. They're so much fun. My oldest is in preschool. Our wow. little guy is, yeah, just starting to walk and babble. And you know, you know that, that phase so well. Mm -hmm. It's the best. It's so cute. And you have the holidays coming up. I, I just love it, Mandy, because I was telling you that every time I look at your Instagram and I when you post about your kids I'm like Mandy is so happy to be a yeah. mommy I and you can it. I can just tell that it's, it's like means everything to it you it means everything I mean I feel so lucky to get to have the balance of work but man yeah being a mom is number one mm -hmm. and what about the music part of your life because sometimes when I look at you I imagine you here in studio 1a singing away <sighs> with your yeah cute husband I miss it yeah. yeah we were on tour last year together while I was pregnant and I sort of had to take a little bit of a beat but I'm excited to figure out music again and obviously with Taylor it would, it's a no-brainer just to collaborate with him. It's, it's crazy because you actually shot this this show, Dr. Mm -hmm. Death. Yeah. Like, you had, had a six-week-old I had a six-week-old. How did you do that? Like, I couldn't even <laughs> make Honestly, an order on Grubhub. <laughs> <laughs> I think because it all happened so last minute, like, I wasn't planning on this. The opportunity yeah. came about, and I had this month-old baby, and I thought, well, let me read the scripts and see about moving my entire family across the country to New York. And I mean, I just couldn't say no to the chance. Wow. It so, uh, makes it all the more remarkable. Oh, you're We sweet. love you, Mandy. We're so I happy you came. Thank you, Thanks for yes. having me. Have yes. an awesome Christmas with you those too. babes. And Mandy's mm. going to stick around all morning long with her co-star next with Edgar, Edgar Ramirez. Mm -hmm. That's in the fourth hour, right? Uh, ah, yeah. yes. Or maybe the third. Whatever. Just keep watching all 25 <laughs> hours of this show <laughs> and you'll see good in stuff. And you can find all episodes of Dr. Death Season 2 streaming this Thursday on Peacock. Check it out. Coming up next, the changes you need to make to your skincare routine to make it through the worst of winter with a glow. But first, this is today on NBC.
Welcome back this morning on Your Health, Winter Skin Woes, as I put my earpiece in. The new season is arriving this week, and it's time to revise and refresh your routine. So here with some do's and don'ts that will keep your skin healthy and glowing like Brad Pitt's board-certified dermatologist, Dr. Deborah Wattenberg. Hi, Deborah. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Good. So, I mean, let's just talk first, like, why we get winter skin and, you know, what are, it's just kind of gray and ashy and not nice. Yeah, so it's cold. It's dry. There's no humidity in the air, and as a result, all of the moisture leaks out of your skin, and you become super dry and irritated and inflamed, and everybody does all the wrong things for their skin. We got a lot of products, but you are not a person that's like, do a 14-point skincare regime. You no. Think keep it simple. Keep it really simple. Right now, I'm very into serums, mm -hmm. and serums that contain the hero ingredients. They contain all concentrated actives, okay. and so as a result, here we have the hydrating serums, and if you add in hyaluronic acid or you add in polyglutamic acid, they act like a sponge. They pull all the water directly onto your skin, apply a moisturizer right on top of it, little sunscreen, and you're good to go. These products are great. You want to read for ingredients and make sure that you have what you're looking for. But the hyaluronic acid, that's a that's a moisture thing. It, hyaluronic acid and polyglutamic acid, they're okay. both hero ingredients that help for moisture. You can also add in niacinamide, which is a really great product for anti-inflammatory. Okay. It helps with brown spots. It helps with fine lines and wrinkles. It Could helps. you do both if you were You can. Energetic? If you want to do both, you can do both, and they work really well together. And then for the those who are struggling in the wintertime with their retinols, the products that are anti-aging, they're getting really dry and irritated, you can either sandwich it between your humectants, your hyaluronic acid, or your polyglutamic, or switch over to Picuchiol, which is another anti-aging serum that you can put under your moisturizer. It'll help to improve the texture, the tone, the color. Okay, so basically with serums, it's serum first, moisturizer after. Correct. You always want to use the liquid, whatever's liquidy and runny, before you go to something that's creamy or ointment or greasy. Okay, so these were some of our do's. What are our don'ts for winter skin? I think we've got this panel behind you. So for the don'ts, you don't want to take super long showers. Boiling hot showers are going to pull all the moisture out of your skin. Mm. You don't want to use drying cleansers. Um, foamy cleansers that are crazy drying to the skin. What about exfoliating? Can you still do so that? So you can exfoliate. It's really okay to exfoliate as long as you do it gently and you don't do it every day. And then you follow up with your serum and your moisturizer so it pulls the, into the skin. It pulls oh. all the moisture into the skin. Okay, let's move on to the, the whole body. Skin is your largest organ, isn't it? That is correct. Fun uh, fact for your next cocktail party. And as a result, through sweating and perspiration, yeah. you can also lose a lot of hydration through your skin. So you want to keep it really moist. Um, I'm a big fan of these oil-based cleansers and moisturizing cleansers, and you want to be sure to use them to hydrate your skin. You also want to switch over to moisturizers that are thicker, creams, ointments, Like lotions, for your body, body lotion. For your body, followed by these moisturizers. And you don't want to forget your lip balm. You want mm. to use a lip balm to make sure that your skin is, your lips don't get really chapped and yeah. inflamed and irritated. So those work really well as. Okay, and this moisturizer you put on after your lotion? So yeah, this is an oil-based mist, and oh. you can use it instead of a moisturizer. You just spray it on just a teeny oh, yeah. bit mm -hmm. onto your skin. Oh, you rub okay. it in, and it seals all the moisture into your skin and prevents you from becoming really dry. It might be a nice thing to do irritated. right before bed. It's a great thing to do before bed. It's also great to do right after the shower when your skin is still wet. Oh. You seal in the moisture. Oh, okay, cool. And then finally, what do we have? Because, there, you know, there are a lot of skin conditions that can be exacerbated by the winter. Right, so in the winter time, things like eczema and acne create issues for a lot of people. If you have acne, you want to get rid of your mineral oil and your lanolin and your petrolatum in your moisturizer. Switch to an oil-free moisturizer and maybe cut back on some of those drying products, the benzoyl peroxides, the salicylic acids that you're using to keep your acne under control, but you might need it a little bit less. For your eczema, your psoriasis, you want to choose products that contain anti-inflammatories as well as products that will moisturize the skin and prevent them from getting too inflamed or irritated. And then other things you want to be sure to do are to um, cover your face from the wind, wear gloves mm. when you need to. Those types of things will also make a really big difference. Add a humidifier to your bedroom. Mm, Those good. things will help as well. That sounds cozy. Dr. Wattenberg, thank you so much. And coming up next, football and faith. We're going to take you inside the game with the Ravens team chaplain, the very important role he plays in Baltimore's winning ways. But first, this is today on NBC.
We are back 850 with our series inside the game. So those Baltimore Ravens locked up a playoff spot last night. They're one of the best teams in the league mm. right now. Some of the team's success belongs to a subtle presence on the sidelines. NBC Savannah Sellers went to Baltimore for this one. I did. I think you all will love it. Good morning, everyone. So we know that NFL teams, of course, spend the week learning the playbook, but a lot of them are also studying a prayer book. Every team has a chaplain, and I got to spend time with the beloved member of the Ravens who plays as important a role as the players running the ball each week. Many Sundays are a day dedicated to football and to faith. And it is not for them, Lord, it is for your glory. But few people combine the two more fully than Johnny Shelton, team chaplain for the Baltimore Ravens. We're leaning on you, Lord, for your protection. A spiritual guide on the sidelines of every game, like Sunday night in Jacksonville against the Jaguars. Do most people know that this is a part of an NFL team? Most people don't know, which is a good thing for us is that you stay out of the way. Well, today's your moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's God's moment. <laughs> All 32 NFL teams have a chaplain, but the Ravens say they are one of a handful that have theirs in-house full-time. The blessing is being able to be in the building full-time. Things that just come up where people need to talk or they want advice. Johnny has been with the team for a decade, in addition to scheduled Bible studies for different groups, like coaches, players, and even their significant others. Johnny's door is always open for counseling. What are the types of things that the players come to you about? They come to me with football pressure, family pressure, relationship issues. Life is hard enough. And at the flip side of that, football is hard enough. So when you put those two together, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Johnny makes it easy for players to seek him out when they need him, doing a prayer walk around the training fields at the start of every practice. I pray for, for the safety, for the minds, the hearts to be clear, to be able to focus um, on the task at hand. And, and they will literally come up and some of them will ask for prayer personally. And so it's a, it's a right special time. Right here on time. the field. Yeah. Yeah, right here as we as we're going going as I'm coming around. The same is true on game day when Johnny will pray with players individually on the sidelines and collectively as a team in the locker room. So right before we go out to take the field, the last thing we do is we pray as a, as a team. Johnny's message resonates with players of faith like three time Pro Bowl defensive back Marlon Humphrey. Football comes up occasionally, but it's it's mainly just life, different things going on, relationship. Even sometimes when it is football, it's it's more so just how can you be more of a leadership role? As well as with former player and current assistant coach Anthony Weaver. We're football coaches, we're football players. We assume we're alphas, right? Mm -hmm. We can we can solve and we can figure out everything. And you it's not natural to turn to somebody for help and for guidance. He makes that easy. You mentioned some of the players that aren't Christians. Is your door open to all faiths, all beliefs? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm here to I'm here to love all. We're not going to disciple everybody. So whatever their faith is, we're, we're here to love them. That's what Jesus did. The influence of a chaplain is felt throughout the NFL. Once a month, the chaplains across the league have a Zoom call together. Those are my guys. I know them very well. We're able to lean on. We're, we talk with each other. The league chaplains also shepherd one of game day's more touching traditions, a post-game prayer circle formed by members of both teams. The chaplains call it, meet me at the 50. We will pray together, just thanking God for to be able to have this competition to play this great game of football. Is he not the best? Yes. Chaplain Johnny. The best. And what's really cool for him, he was a football player himself. Mm. There's a verse that he read long ago that inspired him to read the Bible more because it sounded like football to him. It really <laughs> connected with him. It's in 2 Timothy and it says, be prepared in season mm. and out of season. Mm -hmm. so he really loves his job. Even says he pictures Jesus as a linebacker, which I just thought was too cute. Uh, and this assignment, you guys, I was so grateful to get it. I scored some major cool points with my husband. We're Raven's household oh, wow. going on New Year's Eve. I know. So oh, wow. I know. Okay. I know. That, that was awesome. That was great. Story. Great yeah, story. He's, so he's yeah, amazing. Yeah. He's Thank amazing. you so much. Great Thank job. You, Savannah. All right. Coming up ahead on the fourth hour, Lily James from the highly anticipated movie The Iron Claw will be with us. Coming up first on the third hour, John Cryer will have to tell us about his brand new NBC comedy after your local news and weather. Hi, everybody. Good morning.
morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. <laughs> the boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. This morning on the third hour of today, new questions. Friend star Matthew Perry's death ruled an accident caused by a powerful and controversial drug used to treat addiction and depression. What his autopsy report reveals. Plus, our consumer confidential, hot tips for the holidays. Who should we be tipping and how much? Plus, co-stars Mandy Moore and Edgar Ramirez live in studio, filling us in on their intense new show based on a true story. Today, Monday, December 18th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good Monday morning. Welcome to the third hour of today. It is great to see you guys, Good morning, everybody. See you guys all this together. Uh, we it's hope. true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, some invite us. We'll come over. <laughs> yeah, sure. Back. My house is a. How was it? What, how was your week? Yeah. It, it was awesome. It was Calvin's seventh birthday. Wow. I that can't, went fast. <laughs> it went so fast. Um, so there we are. He's like the leader of our pack now. Oh. So he wanted this cake. You know, it's the cake that has has the filling on the inside oh, so you yeah. cut the into it. So he helped me make it. And then when you cut into it and you pull out that slice, you get yes. the whole little party going party on in the middle. Inside. So the, you know the anticipation for the sure. other two, like waiting, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? So, so did you make a gluten free cake? I made a gluten free cake <laughs> with all the food dye. Wow. Ta -da. You made that? I made that. That's impressive. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that is that's impressive. And it was delicious. And he it's like just a science had, project. He just had such a wonderful day. It was that's just sweet. it was just that. really feels the love. How about you? Yeah, what about you? We had a full weekend. Okay. Had a full weekend. We had the uh, Christmas pageant yesterday. Oh, oh. oh that was Lindsay and I. Are at you a, like at Mr. and Mrs. Claus? Look at you. Okay. We had a couple of holidays. Mr. and Mrs. Parties. Cool Claus. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mrs. maybe, certainly not Mr. Oh. There was, Sybil was the angel this year. Oh. She was promoted last year. She was the bear. And, uh, <laughs> there was a bear at the nativity scene? Uh, there was, yes. <laughs> Delano was a donkey. Okay. Um, and in the uh, is, in the is that in the play. Mache? Wow. No, it's a blow up donkey. Oh, okay. And he's wearing a well, shirt. That's, that's funny. That says, kind of runs in the family. I'm a donkey. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, that, I'm surprised it took you that long. And so then he had a football clinic on um, Saturday afternoon, and it was like a one on one skills clinic. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he was the best at the clinic, so he got that's to take awesome. a picture with this kid wow. who's standing next to him. That kid won the state championship for Staples High School with a last minute tackle. That saved the game. That's fun. So right. Dell was really it inspired. Like Dell's really liking the football thing. Huh? He loves it. I, I didn't know that. you could get paper and football at Staples. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll vote. That's amazing. What about you? Oh, God. Uh, yeah, we picked up Nick from college. Oh, that's so, right. Uh, that's we've busy got, weekend. but is, here's a funny thing: is we've got like a grown man now. Yeah. Because he's he, he had Look a white Cosmo alone. With us. Oh wow! A little champagne there, him. right? A little little champagne at brunch, you know. Can you imagine when your kids oh, can like have a cocktail, have a drink with you? But and he is literally plowing through everything in the fridge. Oh, so, wow. I say the drinks. So like, oh. No, 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 no. That's, he's okay but with food, that. Yeah. But the food, yeah. You have to stock like, up again. That's awesome. And how about your one? So we have an update to a saga that has been eight years in the making. Oh. So I posted this video on Instagram eight years ago. Watch this. This was eight years ago. It. Kaye. No way. No, this is not a game. Somebody drew on the couch. Kaye? It's not me. I would never do that. 
I would never do that. Okay. So there was a red Sharpie uh, all over the couch. Yes. We found out this weekend who did it. What? I heard them talking in the kitchen, and I'm like, wait you a minute. still have that couch? I, yeah, it's covered <laughs> with a nice little blanket. Guess who did it? Who did it? Clara. Clara. Yeah. It was Clara. Clara. It was Clara. How did you? The whole time, my little, her twin was like, <laughs> Clara, mommy, Clara. And I'm like, no, not Clara. And Kai's like, I would never do that. He was telling me. Who did truth. you blame for the last eight years? We, I just let it go because they were all so, <laughs> I just wasn't sure. But did you let it go? I mean, they, I heard him talking about it. It's so funny. That's like, funny. And it's funny on Instagram. So many people have stories with siblings who had things that oh, happened yeah, in their yeah. childhood, oh, yeah. and they never tell. And they weren't telling me. They were just talking about it. My younger brother it. Ryan and I, when we were young, much younger, we got into this fight. Yeah. And I accidentally, like, knocked a hole in his door, and we covered it with the poster. <laughs> and for 12, 13 years, no one knew how the hole got there. Oh. And finally, one day, I was over there, and I just fessed up. Yeah. My mom, you, you would have thought we were 10 again. No, no, we still got in trouble. The statue of limitations. My brother and I did that. Same really? thing. Same thing. A hole in the wall? In the wall. Yeah. In the wall. See, there uh, you was go. it you or Chris, though? Who did it? It was me. Yeah. But I fessed up to it See, pretty quick. boys are just yeah. so, like, we are. There's holes all over. And apparently little go. girls, too. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, hopefully you had a whole free weekend. Uh, <laughs> meantime, millions of folks had a wet and windy weekend. Massive storm soaking from California into the Carolinas, uh, making its way up the coast into the northeast. It has been a rough morning commute down power lines and trees. Uh, as you see, it is just a mess, and it's still hanging in there. As uh. you look at the radar, you can see uh, this thing is pushing up to the north. It is causing big problems, interior sections of the northeast in New England. 53-mile-per-hour wind gust in Boston, 14 in LaGuardia, 59 wind gust, 150,000 homes without power. Heavy rain, another 4 to 6 inches in parts of northern New England. And locally, the wraparound snow, some lake snow upwards of 12 inches between Cleveland and Buffalo and along the spine of the Appalachians. Mm, quite so, the storm. So once that rain moves out, though. Yeah, we'll, but we'll still have a lot of wind and some leftover showers and snow. Mm -hmm. So airports are going to be a mess mm -hmm. along the I-95 corridor and inland as well. All right. Thanks, Al. Well, turning now to new details and questions, really, about the death of Friends star Matthew Perry. The actor's autopsy report ruled his death an accident, saying Perry died from the acute effects of the drug ketamine. Mm -hmm. NBC News medical contributor Dr. John Torres is here, but we want to begin this morning with NBC's senior national correspondent Kate Snow with the latest. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning guys. So remember, this came out on Friday. Ketamine is an anesthetic. It's a hallucinogen that's sometimes used recreationally, but recently it's also been studied for its potential to treat mental health disorders, including depression, and now it is being blamed for the death of Matthew, Matthew Perry, who talked openly about his own struggle with substance abuse. This morning, new questions surrounding Matthew Perry's death as the world remembers the beloved star. I'm gonna hug you. You hug me. All right. <laughs> In an autopsy report released Friday, the medical examiner determined the 54-year-old died from the acute effects of ketamine, ruling his death an accident. Ketamine is a fast-acting hallucinogen approved by the FDA as an anesthetic. It gained popularity as a party drug because it boosts feel-good chemicals in the brain and causes a euphoric effect. But recently, ketamine has increasingly been offered off-label at clinics to treat depression and other mental health disorders, and has even been studied to treat alcohol and drug abuse. Perry was known for his light-hearted on-screen persona. I'm not great at the advice. Can I interest you in a sarcastic comment? <laughs> but had a long history with addiction. It's so cunning, baffling, and powerful, alcoholism and addiction. It's a disease that we have, and we don't know that we have it. In his memoir released last year, the actor wrote about being given ketamine during rehab. Taking ketamine is like being hit in the head with a giant happy shovel. But the hangover was rough and outweighed the shovel. Ketamine was not for me, he wrote. It's unclear how Perry obtained the ketamine that led to his death. But according to officials, Perry was reported to be receiving ketamine infusion therapy for depression and anxiety, and his last treatment was a week and a half before his death. The examination found the amount of ketamine in his blood was equivalent to the amount used for general anesthesia, levels, the report says, too high to be residual from his last clinical treatment. Perry was found floating face down in his hot tub in October. One of the contributing factors, authorities also noted, a drug buprenorphine, approved by the FDA to treat opioid use disorder, which people often stay on for years. I just want to say that I, I love you. 
Recently, Friends co-star and close friend Jennifer Aniston told Variety that Perry was getting healthy, adding he wasn't struggling, he was happy. A witness who talked to investigators said that Perry had been sober for 19 months. The autopsy found no evidence of drugs like fentanyl or heroin or cocaine in his system. For now, it's unclear if investigators will look into how Perry obtained that ketamine. But obviously, guys, this news is so difficult for his family and for all his fans. Yeah. Yeah. Right, for sure. Okay. Dr. John, let's talk about ketamine for a second because we were, you know, lots of questions about it. Right. Mm -hmm not approved by the FDA for the treatment of, of any sort of psychiatric issues. Right. Ketamine is approved by the FDA for a treatment for anesthetic. It's okay. called an associate anesthetic, which means they give it to you. We did it in the emergency room often. We do it all the time. And it's, when we give it to you, we can do painful procedures we need to do, and you don't care about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not putting you to sleep. It's just making you not care about it. Can you talk about this off-label treatment? I mean, the reality is, I remember when Kate Snow did a story. I mean, it is working for, for some patients. Was it just too much? Or? It, it seems to be working for some patients. And we do think he probably had that a week and a half before he died because he said, yes, that's what last time he had it. What we don't know is what happened that day. Ketamine lasts three to 10 hours in your body. So, so it, it, had to be within the, the it should have been out of the system mm. easily within half a day. How, how does it work? The, the actual drug, what does it do to your body? So ketamine, we don't really know how it works. It works on receptors in the brain and it occupies some of those receptors, but beyond that, we don't really know how it works very well, but it is what we call a dissociative an anesthetic, like I mentioned, and people say, I took a trip. I just, I, it was so vivid. I wasn't there, I was out of my body and I didn't really care what happened. And so unfortunately, something like that, especially if you're taking another medicine and he was taking buprenorphine, which is used for opioid addiction to try and get them off the opioids. If you're taking combination medicines, that can cause an issue. So if you get your hands on this outside of a controlled setting, is it easy to overdose? It is, so it is easy to overdose, but that overdose, it's rare to get. It's a party drug. It's used all the time. People talk about going down the K-hole, which they had really bad experiences. And even Matthew Perry said, I didn't like it when I took it, yeah. so I, I don't like it that much. And it gives people these bad experiences. They don't like them. They can get racing heart rates. They can get high blood pressure. They can get these very vivid, sometimes disturbing dreams and hallucinations. But as far as dying from it, it's very rare. Oh. But he was in a pool. He was in a pool. Yeah. So that you, know, you can't react to the things you need to react yeah. to if you get underwater. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. When we did that story a while ago, they said you have to be in a clinical setting if you're going to try this treatment, you know, mm -hmm. just to monitor your exactly. heart rate and all yeah. your breathing. And the reaction. Learning clearly yeah, about it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, coming up, it's a holiday edition of our Consumer Confidential. You need some tips about tipping. Vicki Wynn is going to share who we should be tipping and how much. Mm. Then later, co-stars Mandy Moore and Edgar Ramirez Beautiful. live talking about their new series, based on a shocking true story that hits kind of close to home here at NBC. <laughs> Third hour of the day will be right back. Consumer Confidential. This season is traditionally a time to show appreciation. And for certain people, that means a holiday tip. But there's an etiquette to giving. So here to help us navigate our senior consumer investigative correspondent, Vicki Wynn herself, is here. Hello. Vicki, we need to give you a tip because you're always right. helping That's us. That's true. You guys are too kind. Through well, everything. But, okay, so before we get into specifics... You have to tip some people. Is money the way to go? Cash is generally king, but the etiquette experts would say the general rule of thumb here is who are you tipping? People that you interact with regularly over the course of the year, right? People who are in your home or you go to their place of business and they provide some kind of service for you. But there are two categories where you don't want to give cash. 
postal carriers, it's hmm. it's prohibited by law for them to accept well, cash. Can you that. give them a gift card? <laughs> you can give them a gift card or okay. some sort of gift with a value up to twenty dollars. Okay. The other area where the etiquette folks say it's frowned upon is teachers because yeah. it can be seen as you're trying to influence your child's yeah. educator. So a small well, you gift should there. Still get them a gift. You should still get yeah. them a small gift. Sometimes classrooms do a collection yes. at the very yeah. beginning of the year, which is wonderful, and then it's distributed not just to the teacher but also the aides. Yeah. They work so hard. Yeah. Um, and sometimes teachers have wish lists on Amazon or Target or Walmart. You can find out about that and just buy them the items they need as a gift. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. So those, and also, by the way, if you can't give money, that's okay. If cash is tight, which it is for a lot of folks, a kind note goes a long way. If you're a great chef, cook, make a little something, sure. just ask ahead. Maybe you want to make a rum cake and the person doesn't, you know, imbibe alcohol, <laughs> or you want to give something that has nuts and they're allergic. So just ask about <laughs> dietary restrictions. But okay. People, but nice. people love a homemade, Absolutely. thoughtful mm -hmm. gift. Absolutely. So it is it. truly the okay. thought and the kind words. Okay, how about the folks who take personal care of us or our loved ones. Yes, these are very important people, as we know. The nannies, the au pairs, the people who take care of your elderly relatives or people in your family. So we'll start here with the live-in nanny. Generally, the folks at Emily Post Institute say one week's pay would be great. We can go back, the babysitter, one night of pay, if that's a regular babysitter that you use. The daycare is interesting. So you could give a group gift. You should check ahead with the daycare for their policy, or it's 25 to $70, very specific range mm, there. Yeah for each of the people that takes care of your child at a daycare. Oh. Now we can move to the home, in-home care. So if you have one person that's generally coming to give care, that's a week pay is the customary tip there. If it's an agency, let's say different home health aides are coming, those mm -hmm. folks work so hard. Yes. Yeah. Call the agency, ask if there is a policy there, or you can give a, a group gift that they can share, a treat that can be shared among the staff. Mm -hmm. Vic, let's talk about folks who, who might work around your house or if you live, especially in New York, uh, one of these skyscrapers who work around the building. Yeah. Yes. And we forgot to mention the pet groomers and pet walkers, by the oh, way. Yeah. That's typically yeah. a session or a, a week. Okay. But the folks that clean your home, if you have a regular housekeeper that comes, tip them the cost of one house cleaning session around this time of year. Landscapers, anywhere in the range of $20 to $50, depending on how big your yard is, how much work they're doing throughout the year. And then the trash collectors, $10 to $30 each. Best to give it to them in person, but maybe yeah. you're at work, you're not there. You can always go to the office and drop off a tip mm. and tell them your address. They will connect it I'll with the people it on your route. The yeah, no, no. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then let's say you live in a city like ours and you're in this big building. There are lots of times there's a handyman or a super who comes, fixes the heater, the yeah. sink, the plumbing. Mm -hmm. Depending on how often they're in your apartment helping you out, the range is $20 to $100. For the doorman, $25 to $100. Maybe they're always taking your packages for you, bringing things up to your door. You know best what is appropriate. And you can also talk to your neighbors to compare notes if that makes yeah. you feel more comfortable mm -hmm. and finally the folks who handle your car so yes. you know some people very, feel very uh, specific about this and they say you know if you don't want your car to have any dings or scratches and to be well taken care of <laughs> take care of the folks not to say that they don't right, right. absolutely <laughs> it's a All right, let's talk about the folks who make you look good. Maybe your barber, your hairstylist, yes. some of those folks. I like to refer to them as our special effects team. The hair ah, folks, right? they, that's you cute. go to them all the time. They're painting your nails, doing the art. Those folks, the cost of one visit is a really nice tip this time of year for them. They work really hard. And then if you're lucky enough, to be working with a personal trainer, the cost of one session is what oh, the etiquette experts would recommend is a customary tip for this time of year. It's a lot of tips. It's, it's a lot of people. Right of money. As I was saying to that Dylan, mo money, mo problems. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Vicky. Coming up, uh, Mandy Moore and Edgar Ramirez are here. They're joining us live to fill us in on their intense new medical series. It's based on a true story. Started watching it last night. It is fantastic. We're going to talk about it with them. And then later and start today, we're going to show you a, a simple Pilates workout that you can do at home. Third hour of today, right back after this. Demi-plié.
We are back with two major forces in Hollywood who are now teaming up in an intense new Peacock show. For six seasons, Mandy Moore, of course, starred as Rebecca Pearson in that show we absolutely loved around here, the NBC series This Is Us. She picked up an Emmy nomination for that. And Edgar Ramirez earned nominations of Zone for his role in the miniseries Carlos and for playing Gianni Versace in the assassination of Gian Gianni Versace, American Crime Story. Well, now they're together in season two of Dr. Death. This season, it focuses on the true story of a former NBC News producer who falls for a surgeon that she's actually doing a profile on. Hi. Hi. Is that Hannah's file? Yeah. I'm just going through the details again. You seem to have a lot of rituals. I didn't realize surgeons were so superstitious. It's more like a prayer. It doesn't matter how many times I perform these operations, I always get nervous. You think you're prepared, but there can always be something that you miss that can cost a life. I cannot imagine the stress. Mm. Mandy, Edgar, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Here. So, Mandy, it's based on a true story, and yeah. it's really close to home for a lot of us when we heard this story. It's hard to believe, based on, on a story of a Dateline producer who yeah. used to work here. Tell me about this when you, when you first read this script. Yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of information out there about Dr. Paolo Macchiarini uh, and, and Benita. I mean, there's tons of news articles out there. And, and the show's actually based on a podcast. So uh, it was sure. Benita, the character. Character that I played telling her own story in her own words, which was fascinating and just incredibly harrowing. And not to give away too much for folks who aren't familiar with the story, but Edgar, your character's pretty dark. You're, you're a dark guy. Um, and you said recently that this is one of the darkest characters you've ever played, but you've turned down similar roles. What was it about this particular dark character where you're like, this is dark I can do? Um, well, because he fell in love with Mandy Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Easy so, sell. Yeah. No so, yeah, there was a love story right at the core of the show. And I think that that's what makes the entire series so special. Because it, it is true, it's true crime, and it's based on real events, and it's based on very, um, a very dark subject. But at the same time, there is a very compelling, interesting love story. And I think that that makes it for me as an actor more pleasurable mm -hmm. to navigate and at the same time it creates a tension within the series that I haven't seen in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because we look at the crowd behind us now this is such an iconic area here yeah. Yeah. Rockefeller Plaza I noticed in one of the shots you know you were walking past and I saw the flags in the background what was it like shooting in such an iconic place? I think I Edgar and I were both right. so excited <laughs> yeah. to be in Rockefeller yeah, Plaza we like shooting it. it it was sort of a bucket sure list idea mm -hmm. that we had a couple of scenes set here and milling the Taurus milling right. around and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, cool. yeah. Yeah. When you're handling dark material like right. this, it, I mean, you guys have such great chemistry on camera, but w what is it like when you're not filming? I mean, mm. how do you kind of decompress from the heavy stuff? Mm. It was, it's funny because we get this question a lot. Yeah. We, 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 we committed fully to mm. the story so that by the time we wrap, we were completely back to ourselves. Yeah. I don't know. It you was, find ways yeah, to you like bring the yeah. levity yeah, to, totally. to work as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we work very similarly. Mm -hmm. Mandy yeah. and I have oh, very, good. very so? similar. We're, I think yeah. we approach the job yeah. the same way. We we both have like constant conversations about scenes. We yeah. like to rehearse. We like to sort of like really get in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe a little palate cleanser is the holiday. It's Christmas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you got the, 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 your kids. What are you guys going to be doing for mm. the holidays? We both live in Los Angeles, yeah. so I'll be home with my family celebrating a but Christmas. a warm Christmas, but taking in the spirit of the holiday here mm -hmm. with the tree and everything. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. Same, same, same in LA with family, with friends, you yeah. know, very relaxed, you know, with very comfy socks. <laughs> <laughs> I love sure. I like comfy socks. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm already, I'm already, I'm already, I'm gearing up. I'm gearing up. I'm gearing up. Very you look quite cuddly right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's part of the, it's part of the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Really quickly, in the first episode, you it, it, it you, you speak multiple languages. The mm -hmm. audience learns this. Yeah. In real life, I read that you speak five. Is that true? Five languages. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How, do, how does one go about learning five <laughs> languages? Well, I was very lucky that my dad uh, was in the diplomatic corps. My dad was a it was like a, a military attaché, so sort of like a military diplomat. So I was very lucky that I lived in different places and learned. Wow. 
different languages so languages is always a kid are they like yeah. fresh like you can i won't make you do that but can you just like switch around different languages that's not an easy I, thing to do i i i, I can dip, yeah that's a great, <laughs> like, that's a great yeah. party yeah. trick yeah. yeah. maybe that's how many languages do you speak five languages. one barely <laughs> <laughs> there you go barely. Barely. Right there. Barely. Yeah. we're with you all right you mandy edgar thank you so much thank you guys thank, thank you very much don't forget season two of dr death premieres thursday on peacock the streaming service from our parent company nbc so good all right still to come we are raising the bar and start today with a fun workout you can do right at home. So stand by. And then actor John Cryer is here in Studio 1A. Oh, He's back go. in a brand new NBC sitcom that a lot of families are going to relate to. We'll be right back. start today on this Monday morning with a workout to tone up as we head into the holidays. So here to help is Pilates and bar instructor Raven Ross. You might recognize her from season three of Netflix's Love is Blind, where she was seen doing workouts in the pod. Show is so huge. Well, she's also been crushing the fitness scene with her classes, Pilates by Raven, and she's here to show us easy moves. Raven, you say this is something that we can all do at home, yes? Yeah, these are all exercises you can do at home, especially with the new year coming up. It's important to really get into it now especially while everyone's in the house, making food, spending time okay. with people they yeah. love. So and we get up and do this Yeah, you us. can do it with this. And so you don't necessarily need a real ballet bar, but you can no. use a chair. A chair, a countertop, okay. the wall, anything. Okay, and you say small movements can make a big difference ultimately? A huge difference. Okay. All your supportive muscles, mm -hmm. this is it. All right, let's okay. do it. So let's start okay, with the here first we go. Exercise. So place your left hand on the chair and open up your legs and your feet nice and wide. We're gonna bend our knees over your toes and get nice and low. Yeah, there you go, Al. <laughs> Good, place your hand on the chair, then stand up and give a big stretch to the chair. Oh, Yeah, there you go, to the left. Do it one more time. Left. Bend your knees, perfect. <laughs> I will and then don't stretch do no. over to the left. Yeah. One more. Okay. Get nice and low. And then stretch over to the chair. Good. Okay. So that's exercise number one. Okay. Easy. Okay. Exercise number two. Keep your left hand on the chair. Bend your knees. You're going to take your right leg out to the side. Like you're doing a little dance move. Now lift that leg up. Beautiful. Now lift it a little higher. Perfect. Now bend it. <laughs> now go up an inch and down an inch. You should feel your right hip working, right? Oh, yeah. If you've ever been to right a Pilates now. class, I'm sure you automatically feel these muscles right here. And what is this oh, doing? Yeah. This is really working your adductors. This is working your supporting leg you should definitely feel that leg on fire your core your balance your posture okay. now let's work should you do this uh you should do it for i like to do time so like 30 seconds okay let's do another one face your chair everyone remember just a light touch now keep your right leg bent can you lift it up to the ceiling and down like your toe is tapping up to the sky it's just a little tiny move your knee goes up and down Okay. You should feel a little bit different muscles here. You should yeah. feel maybe your right hamstring mm -hmm. yep. and still your left leg. I like the idea of just doing it to a certain amount of time. That way yeah. you're not trying to have to count, do counts. Yeah. Right. Like I'm, so I'm a like cheater too. Yeah. Like, just, That's good. Wearing Pilates socks. Are and then do you alternate <laughs> legs? Exactly. You would alternate legs. Okay. okay. So now we're going to work the front body a little bit more. Take your left hand back onto the chair. Point your right toe out in front of you nice and long and bring your right arm up. So you should feel like a beautiful little ballerina here. Now lift your right leg 
up, almost like you're gonna tap the person in front of you and then tap it back down. What is it about Pilates that you love? I mean, people love yoga, people love mm -hmm. cardio. Why Pilates for you? I love Pilates because it's just so accessible. It's something you could do at home, on the go, anytime. And yeah. it's so core strengthening, which is really important for women, especially as we age. Okay. And now this is hold your leg up. You could do while you're waiting for the I water know. to boil. <laughs> exactly, while you're waiting for water to boil. Anyone feel their right side literally on fire? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I love that. Okay. okay, cool. Yeah, those are your exercises, you guys. Do you have one for our calves? Oh, yes, we have one for your calves. So okay. take your left hand back onto the chair. Okay. Okay. Bring your heels together. Your feet are in a little V. Now bend your knees and then straighten oh, your yeah. legs and lift your heels up. I heard some snap crackle yes, pops. So there you go. Those are my ankles. Bend your knees. You know what's funny? Because it really is like what you do as a little girl in ballet. Yep, but exactly. as adults, we just don't do these kinds of moves. Exactly. So this right. is really strengthening your ankles, getting your blood flowing, your calves, your gastrox really have a lot of blood in them. So we want them to move. Last one, hold well, your heels up. If we can do up. this, we have no excuse. We can do this in the kitchen. We can do this Exactly. Forever. And you're working your balance too, exactly. which is so important. Good stuff, Raven. Thank you so well much. Done, hey now. And you can see Good these moves. Where were you, Melvin? Today com slash start today and check out Pilates by Raven. Thank, Thank you. you. That was great. Thank you so Thanks, much. Guys. All right, coming up next, John Cryer is here live. We're going to find out about his new NBC sitcom and look back at some of his classic roles. Then later, it's a sweet and savory holiday tradition in our house. We're making my family's favorite spare mm. ribs Ooh. and cooking with Cal. We'll be right back. Eddie Joe Melvin calling in, wondering where you were yeah, for the last right segment. Right He's back. I'm back, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's okay. And we are back with an actor who's been entertaining us since the 1980s. John Cryer shot to stardom after his breakout role of Ducky in the classic film Pretty in Pink. He then earned two Emmys for playing Alan Harper on the hit show Two and a Half Men. Well, now he's back in the upcoming NBC series called Extended Family as Jim, a recently divorced father of two. So Jim and his ex-wife Julia are hoping to reframe their separation to a positive experience, choosing to celebrate the end of their marriage in quite the interesting way. And then he asked us to lie. So for our divorce, we decided to go back to the church where we were married. To host what we called the very first reverse wedding ceremony. <laughs> so we gathered friends and family. I slipped into my old wedding dress. I stepped into a cheap suit and an even cheaper wig to resemble how I looked that day. We stood at the altar. Took rings off of fingers. <laughs> I'm gonna pawn these. <laughs> Upon this trip. Good. Uh, <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hey. You know what? We're here. laughing. This show, it's a lot of anticipation. 
Oh, uh, good. Congratulations on the sitcom. Oh, uh, you were you. featured on the cover of the latest um, TV Guide magazine. But it might be because there's this interesting detail um, in the show. Tell me about the concept of nesting. And oh. how it factors into the relationship on the show. Well, obviously, you know, divorce is a very difficult experience, yes. and uh, uh, and it's very difficult on the kids. Um, well, a lot of people, and and this was something that was news to me, uh, are are deciding that instead of uh, having two different homes that the kids shuttle back and forth uh, okay. with, they have they let the kids oh, stay in one place and the parents go back and forth. Huh. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, and uh, so our show was actually very loosely inspired by uh, the, the. Turns out the owner of the Boston Celtics is doing that, where he's okay. sharing an apartment with his wife's ex-husband mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know it, so interesting. And it works. yeah and it works yeah. in, in many ways there 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 is a wonderful friendship there mm -hmm. uh, and and what the show is really about is is uh, divorced people trying to find that kernel of friendship that got them together to begin with uh, you know and and maintain that for the sake nice. of the kids Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it's also very funny and the cast is nuts oh, <laughs> this awesome. is nuts I yeah. So we saw Donald Faison there. He is actually the owner of the Boston Celtics. Not him personally, but his but character. Yes, he would like to be. Was it <laughs> <laughs> He's said that on many occasions. Yes. <laughs> is it true that you were actually considering that role? Oh, yeah. In the well, beginning? when they first uh, came to me, they they said, uh, would you like to play the owner of the Boston Celtics? And I was like, will I get to wear nice suits like this? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was interesting. In, in, in working through the script with the, the, the writer, Michael O'Malley, we just realized that Jim was just much more me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, as, as great as I look <laughs> in a suit. <laughs> um, An ode to Al Roker. Yes, exactly, yeah. well, exactly. Uh, we all try, have our tributes to Al Roker in some way. Uh, Hair, suit. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know what's great about this show, John? I mean, first of all, Michael O'Malley, just one of the great uh, mm. comics and writers. Uh, but also, you got Abigail. She was with us at, uh, at the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And what's great about this is this great feel, throwback feel, like a, mm -hmm. a four-camera sitcom shot in mm -hmm. front of a live studio audience. You know, it just feels good. Oh, well, thank you. It, 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 it's so, it feels so great to be back in front of an audience for me. I mean, obviously, Two and a Half Men ended, I think, in 20... Uh, 15? Wow. Yeah, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and obviously there was COVID, so a lot of the, the yeah. multi-camera shows shut down and just wouldn't shoot with an audience. Um, but we, you know, from day one have been shooting with a live audience and, uh, and, and it's, it, you know, it's just a different vibe. It, it allows you to have so much more fun and to be so much more loose and, and to really work on the comedy in front of people. Because yeah. you hear the laughs. Because you hear the laughs. And, and when, you, when you don't hear the laughs, <laughs> that's when you know... <laughs> That's you got to do some work. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> exactly, um, exactly. That show's going to drop in a few days. You're going to mm -hmm. you're on another show tonight on NBC, Password. Password. Yeah. So I was going through my feed, and I you you said the competition was pretty intense. It, I, well, okay, I've never done a game show before ever. Uh, and when you get there, you know you got it's a game show. It's like yeah. a, it's just fun, and everybody it's just fun. has fun, and they talk about it. Okay. No, <laughs> and, uh, it's very serious when you get there. Because really? people are playing well because your contestants yeah. are playing for real money. Uh, you know, it really is. This is these are life changing amounts of money true. for some of these right. people. You know, uh, uh, and and they're so they're so earnest and happy to be there and so excited and you know it's kind of an otherworldly experience for them That's in many funny. respects. So was there pressure for you then? there? N nobody put it on me yeah, except me. Right. You, don't, you just don't want to be that idiot who gives the dumb password. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and and I was this close several times. Uh, uh, and Fallon, Jimmy Fallon, you know, he's fun and ha ha funny, but he is brutal <laughs> oh. at passwords. Oh, man. Uh, brutal. Very, very talented uh, gentleman, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but it, 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 was a, it was a lovely experience. Uh, and, the, and the woman I was, uh, uh, the contestant I was paired with first, uh, uh, well, I'm not going to say. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to say. Well, people to watch. Yeah. Yes, yes, oh, yes, yes. Just watch. Very important to watch. Oh, just watch. Yeah, very important just to watch. watch. John, she was Bernadette. lovely. She was awesome. John, thank mm -hmm. you. That I Password episode airs tonight. Extended Family, his new show, that's going to premiere Saturday, December 23rd, 8 p.m. Right out. Ooh. Nice. Oh, they think a lot of the Pushy show. That's coming on right after the NFL <laughs> game on NBC. Nice. All right. So Steelers, Bengals. Okay. Catch it. All yes. right, coming up, speaking of families, I'm going to let you in on a delicious Christmas Eve tradition in our house in a holiday edition of Cooking with Cal. Let me come right back.
It's time now for Cooking with Cal, and this time we're making a family favorite, spare ribs. It's a perfect appetizer for the holidays. It's super simple, and it's one I used to have growing up each year on Christmas Eve. Mm. Take a look. It's another edition of Cooking with Cal. What are we making today? Spare ribs. Spare ribs. So this was a recipe my mom always made on Christmas Eve. Right, so I texted her and I asked her for the recipe. And she said, mix together white sugar, garlic powder, soy sauce, coat ribs, bake. That's the recipe for my mom. So, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but you'll help me? Yeah. Okay, so first things first, let's season these up, okay? A little sprinkle, perfect. Nice, now I'll do this. You go crazy with smell. Go crazy with flavor. Oh, can I cook it? This is going to come out super fast. Watch. See how I just do it like this? Okay, my turn. Salt. Be gentle. Let's see if you can do it. Okay, let's try it. Not too crazy, not too crazy, not too crazy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry, this is the most complicated salt and pepper situation we've ever had. Not so much, not so much, not so much. I too. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're going to follow my mom's recipe and use some sugar. Okay. I need some. Let's put a few spoonfuls in here. I really don't know how much to use. No, not handfuls. Mm. <laughs> so I called her and asked her, and she said we want to make the consistency of like molasses or wet sand. Okay? So, this is gluten free soy sauce. Because yeah. for some reason, soy sauce has gluten in it. It's not getting wet. So now it's dark brown sugar. Right? Now let's do it. Oh, sir. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're sorry. Sorry. It's cooking with cow. It's not cooking with umbrella. <laughs> Put all the pork ribs into the dish. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. That's weird. How do you like it? I just... Mm. A little more baby. That's where it's gonna like squish this all together. Oh, maybe why? All the way down, don't touch the inside. All right. Now we wait an undetermined amount of time until they're done. I really don't know, she didn't tell me. All right, I think it's time to take the foil off. And how good does this smell? So good. Oh, look at this. Whoa. See, it's nice and sticky. Our cat. I just stole one from the pan. Yeah. I know you don't like to eat off the bottom, so here. Try this, it's sticky. How sticky? I'm not too sticky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good, isn't it? Mm. Mine's my childhood. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. Mm. Not food, just food. <laughs> It's mm. funny, Calvin doesn't like to eat off the bone, but then Ollie runs in right after that, and he's like, ah, just like, it's wait, waiting for the bone. We are so upset. I know, it. I know. It know. Delicious. I, they're so simple, but you could make them because they're so yeah. easy and so quick. So, boom. Yum. yeah, you should try them. That's they're really good. Good, good suggestion. Thank you, Cal. Thank you. Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> this cooking, with, yeah. cooking with Cal, not cooking with Dylan. He's right. Excuse me. Cal is growing up. Old. We'll be right back. Cal <laughs> wants to know where it's coming.
the third hour today, Bridgerton star Phoebe Deniver is live to share her new thriller. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna from the new movie, The Iron Claw, Lily James. Hope you have a great day and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Today, from the new movie, The Iron Claw, English actress Lily James. Then, get ready to shop the drop with our good friend, Tracy Ellis Ross. Plus, big relationship news for Demi Lovato, Bad Bunny, and Madonna when Justin Sylvester brings us the celebrity scoop. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, so up, it's today it's right with Hoda right and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hi, guys. Welcome. It is Monday. It is December the 18th. It is a stormy, stormy it's a one stormy here. Stormy day. Oh, remind me to give you a piece of my mom's. Oh, I gave you my mom's baklava. I know. I got into my office. Yes. After. After not sleeping very much yes. because it was a very stormy evening. Yes, it was stormy. And my brain was almost yeah. as stormy yes. as the clouds. Yeah. And I guess what I did, I got to eat a baklava yeah. that your lovely mom made all of us. Anyway, my, I just want to say I have some for everybody here too, so I just want to shout that yeah, out. Yeah, so, y'all aren't left um, out. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> are you did you have a good weekend? I had a great weekend. I had a great weekend. I had a good fun. weekend too. You did? Yeah, yeah, we had a great weekend. I I saw, if you guys are coming to New York, N yeah. New York, yeah. Go see Moulin Rouge on Broadway. That's a great one, huh? It was so much fun. My kids, I took my children. Did they both love it? They were a little confused yeah. with some of the scenes, <laughs> but they loved it because the, the music, music, the dancing, they like a love story. Mm -hmm. It is just, I, had, I haven't seen theater in a while, mm -hmm. and to go and be in the theater, I had mm -hmm. chills. I like, love it this. It felt like a really incredible experience. Oh, I love and it. And Titus Burgess, who was on the show. We love Titus. He, he in was it. in it, and he... I mean, there was a period where he sang a note where people just stood up I cheering. Cry. I it love was incredible. Him. I love him. So I was worried that my kids were sitting around too much, not doing anything. You know that feeling when yes. you're like looking around and everyone's blobbing. You saw. So, this is another reason why you're is, like my dad. This is what I did. <laughs> this is what I did. I asked. Alexa. I'm triggered. Every, every 15 <laughs> minutes to sound an alarm. <laughs> I'm so triggered right now. Wait, wait, wait. And the kids are barefoot and it's cold outside. So I said, we're all going to do it. Every 15 minutes, we're going to go outside. We're going to run to the end, tag this pole and come back. The kids were delighted. <laughs> okay. It was real. So fun. your kids were barefoot? We were, we were all in barefoot. New we were York barefoot. City? Yeah, we were. Well, we weren't in the city. No, we didn't run outside in the city. Oh, oh, oh. We okay. Went, you yes, were okay. We were there. But we ran to the end, tagged something, and one kid stayed inside and yelled out of the sliding door, Yo, you can do it! And it was so. It Wait, was that's so, so much fun. Every 15 minutes, someone had to go do it. And everyone was barefoot. Everyone had on t shirt. Everybody was, and it was winter. And it was really Did fun. Did any step, anybody step on any? <laughs> no, 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 okay. No, that, no splinters, nothing. But it's so it funny. It was so fun. Isn't it so interesting? Because sometimes <laughs> I just hear Henry say to himself, why don't our kids ever want to do anything? <laughs> And I'm like, honey, if you had the opportunity just to lounge <laughs> around after you've been totally overscheduled I know. for a whole semester, I know. Let I them, know. sometimes we I just know. gotta let the kids Let's lounge. Let them lounge and do. But how about when they say there's nothing to do? No, I know. Now that then what? That's, is that a trigger? That's there's a trigger. There's nothing to do. Really? I know. About so that? don't complain about being lazy <laughs> when you just want to be lazy. All right. Um, okay. okay. So y'all, there's big birthday news. You're not going to believe who turned 60 years old today. I'm so excited. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Is 60 years old. Oh, my gosh. How about Brad Pitt is 60? Can you believe That's it? That's what 60 looks like. That is what 60 looks, looks like. Good. And it's a big year for a lot of people that are turning 60. Let's go through the list, okay? Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Mrs. Obama. Lenny Kravitz. And... Another person in this class that is incredible, like all of these leaders, is Hoda Kopp. 
You're turning 60 I in 2024. I am so excited about turning 60. I can't even, first of all, I can't even believe that this is me saying this. I know. I look at Brad Pitt, Sandra Bullock, all these people who I sort of came up watching and admiring, Lenny Kravitz, yes. who's like, yes. and Michelle Obama, all these people who you're like, you're kidding me. 60 is amazing. Like, so, it's just so crazy about chapters in life. You know, I'm so glad that all of my stuff is happening now. Yes. Like, I don't, I'm not, there, there was a time where people hid their ages and don't say it and don't say it. You know, that was whenever that was. But anyway, like all of that has. You're not that at all. At all. And never have been. But I feel vibrant, excited, and I feel like I'm evolving. I feel like I'm different. I feel like I'm different than I was a month ago, six months ago, a year ago. And it's, a gr it's like this great, crazy adventure. And I think, you know, we used to dread it. Like everyone, remember like yes. the Golden Girls were all 50. Yeah. It's yes. like, wait, what? I know. Who cares? Uh, totally. Brad Pitt is 60. I know, look Brad at him. Brad Pitt. <laughs> and Hoda Copy. Wow, is wow. 60. And you know but what? by the way, how cool that this is who I get to sit next to every day, yeah. whose attitude <laughs> is this. Well, and not you know scared, not no, fear, not at all, not regret. Free, no. Just think about this: the person who we admire almost more than anyone is Oprah. Yes, Oprah's about to turn seventy. There, it's about evolution. Like you can be thirty and be stuck. You can be thirty and be like a fifty or sixty or seventy year old. We yes. know them. Yeah, you can be forty and be that person. Yeah. But if you are curious and growing and evolving, life's fun. Yeah, it is. Otherwise, you can get stuck at any age. Yeah. I mean, your body's just carrying your coolness around. That's all your body is there for. It's like carrying your spirit around. You're, if your spirit's young, you're young. Yes. And if your spirit's not, you know, you're not. We're sorry for you. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm excited. Okay, we're excited for okay. you. I can't wait till we celebrate you. We've got a little time, but we're, we're thinking about it. <laughs> okay. Okay, Serena Williams is quite the teacher. What did she, do? she posted this video trying to help her six year old daughter, Olympia, with her spelling and vocabulary homework. Okay. Take a look. Next one is they. They don't get it. They. The next word is shape. She got a good shape. Shape. The next word is from. Where you learn how to twerk from. Twerk. Or you get that from your mama. <laughs> it's like, I love her so much. Don't you love that she's like amusing herself? Well, exactly. She's just totally but I will this. say, because I did used to help Mila with her spelling yeah, yeah. homework, yeah. and I would do things like that too. You did? I would try to make funny, some hilarious kind of sentences so, so, so that it was fun. Right, because otherwise, yeah. Spelling is spelling. By the way, some of the homework, how's wait, just Mila's wait. math homework? <laughs> just wait. Mila's math homework is what I did in calculus <laughs> when I failed it the first time. <laughs> When I failed it the first time, which I still have dreams that I'm walking through my high school, going to the class, which I can't find because I've failed it. Mila's fifth grade math homework, and it's so, and I have like hear her being like, so you don't, you don't get this? This is above your math level? To me. And I'm like, uh, no, I understand it. She's like, so do this problem. <laughs> Show me how you do this problem. <laughs> and then I have to oh, no either sneak out or have Henry do it for I have to go right back to that math class in high school. It is so hard. And they don't do it the uh, way. Good luck. What do you mean they don't do it the they way? They don't we do it the way we learned it. What, how you, they remember do when it? you carried the yeah, one and all that? The they, they don't, don't carry do no ones. They don't? They don't carry no ones what? anymore. I don't know why. why. Somebody thought, hey, let's mess with all the parents <laughs> in the world and change the way we teach math. So even though the kids don't know how, the parents wouldn't know how to do it anyway, now they really don't oh know how to God, do it. Oh my God, they don't carry the one? No, they don't carry oh, no, they well don't carry no ones. They don't carry no ones. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even carry twos. They don't carry anything. And long division, it ain't the same. What? I don't know what it is, but they don't do long division anymore. So good luck. All right, All right. coming up next. <laughs>
Oh, that was good. <laughs> Big relationship news from Bad Bunny, Demi Lovato, and Madonna. Look who's here. Justin Sylvester's oh here God. to deliver the scoop yeah, right so after this. Yeah. They don't oh. carry the one. How oh, do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Every morning, get into the holiday spirit with today. We're going to spread some holiday cheer. Some added inspiration to give back this holiday season. We are launching today's toy drive. Holiday gifts for everybody on the list. That is delicious. Our biggest holiday crowd I'm yet. Three, two, one. Make today your home for the holidays. Time to get you caught up on all the big celebrity headlines. He's Justin Sylvester flew in from L.A. just to give us the scoop. How Ooh, lucky we are. I had Hi, to Justin. do it. I had to do it because I got some good scoops. You today. really do. You see. Okay, it's we got juice. celebrity couple news that yeah. we, did, we are very excited about. We are. We have some good, we have some bad, and we have some confusing. Okay, okay. we want to start with the good. No, we're going to start with the bad, bad. first, oh, fine. actually, okay? We're fine. going to get that out the way. Okay. The bad news is that Kendall Jenner and Bad Bunny have oh. split up. They're cute. Now, according to People Magazine, they have done it. They were together for a little under a year. It's a long time. And, you know, Kendall Jenner's that, that sister. You know, most sisters mm -hmm. in that family will go back and forth. They'll redo something yeah. four <laughs> and five times. She is a one and done. If uh -huh. it didn't work, we're not getting back together. Right. So we have no official statements yet from anybody, but the Kardashians are coming back next summer, so I think we're going to go ahead we're and gonna do it. All about if we it. have no official statements, how do we know? They're just the, the gossip mill? The gossip mill. People Magazine reported oh, people it. Oh, people did that. it's true. All right, let's talk about some good, positive couples news. <sighs> Demi Lovato oh, amazing. is one of my favorite artists. She's been through so much. She's kissed a lot of frogs, but it seems she has found her prince mm. with this man right here, Jordan Lutz. Everyone calls him Jutes. He is a songwriter. They met while they were writing her oh. album in oh, 2022. Amazing. And listen to this. She said they met in January and they didn't, start, they didn't date until August mm. of that year. And they just got engaged on Friday night mm. in Los Angeles. And she seemed so happy. She even said she didn't know what her next album was going to be about or what she was going to write about mm. because she is so happy right now. Oh, my gosh. That's She's great. been through. We've yeah. seen her go through so many phases of life. It's so good to see her happy yeah. like that. And pay attention to her because when you see her, she seems so happy and so sure of herself that's right important. now. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. important. That's a good one. All right, so there's a new rumor. Yes, couple. we don't know if it's true or not, but what is it? All right, this one is confusing. All right, Drake and Camila Cabello were seen in Turks and Caicos, what? jet skiing, mm -hmm. and lollygagging around the <laughs> island. Now, this is why it's confusing. Some internet salutes are saying that this is business, that they're going to record a song together. But Drake said that he was putting music on hold earlier this year. Uh -huh. Which means I feel like this is some personal scenario. They're collaborating, but not on music. Wait, did you right say now. they were on a jet ski together? They were on a jet ski together. Now, as you know, Camilla, she loves herself a Canadian. And I know why. Mm -hmm. They're nice men. Yes. They're reliable. You know, she was with Shawn Mendes for oh, years. Right. So this could be a little something. I like it. I yeah. like it. Okay, nobody's confirmed anything. No confirmations yet, but at, legally, I'm going to have to watch this until 2024 <laughs> since I just ran through The Crown Part 2. Have you guys watched oh, The Crown Part 2? I watched it last night. Oh, so, oh, but I didn't watch the whole thing. I just watched the first episode oh, of no, Part no. 2. Get in there. Get in it's there. It's so good. All right, let's talk about Madonna. She's back. She's, she is on tour here in the States. Madonna is here on tour. Now, first of all, she came to Brooklyn. Allegedly, she didn't start the concert till 11. People are up in arms about it. I don't care. I would wait there for three days if yeah. I had to wait, okay? 
But she left you with a few surprises. Okay. okay. You know how she was like dating that 30-year-old mm. like boxer, boxer that everybody was saying she was dating, but she never publicly confirmed right? it? Right. Well, she brought him on stage Ooh. last night because, you know, she brings out a celebrity. What? Yeah, she that brought him? him on stage. That's him. They kissed on stage. Whoa. Wait, what? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. And the next night, which is also some great news, she bought out Julia Garner. Oh, yeah. Now, you know, Julia was supposed to play her in that biopic, yeah, yeah. you know, and it got indefinitely on pause. Yeah. And we didn't know if it was going to happen. But so. this could mean... It's happening. The movie oh. is back on. We hope so. We hope so. Wow. We really do hope so. It could be a really good time. And if you guys. Look at this. Oh, they're together. Yes. I'd like to go see Madonna. She's coming back, but it's on a Monday and Tuesday I night. I know. And, and I know y'all like to be in bed well, by 7 45. I know. We're, if she, we would be asleep before If she starts she at even, 11, then it'd be hard for us. But I'm going to still try. But should you guys should be on stage. Okay. Would you guys go we'll on? Ask her. Would she come on at 8.30 for us? <laughs> that would be a nice trade-off. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you, Justin. Justin. <laughs> you can catch Justin, by the way, opening, uh, hosting E! News Presents, NBC's Hot 10 at 23. It's on December 27th. You might even see us make an appearance. Ooh. Oh, fun. Coming up next, y'all, actress Lily oh. James is here. She's starring in a new movie, getting a ton of buzz. We're going to hear all about it right after this. Yay, Lily. Hi, Lily. Coming up tomorrow, Grammy and Tony winning actress and singer Cynthia Erivo drops by. Plus a knock knock surprise reunion for some high school besties. And we'll make your life easier with some holiday hacks from Laurafied. That's all Tuesday on Hoda and Jenna. know English actress Lily James when she starred in the popular show Downton Abbey and then she hit the big screen in Cinderella and most recently Lily received Emmy and Golden Globe nominations for her portrayal of Pamela Anderson in Hulu's Pam and Tommy. And now she's starring opposite Zac Efron in The Iron Claw. It's a true story of a wrestling family that faced a lot of tragedy in and out of the ring. Take a look. Hi Kevin. Hey. Um. Can I get your autograph? Yeah, sure. Thanks. <clears throat> oh, don't you want to ask me who to make it out to? Oh, yeah. Sure. It's Pam. Pam? Mm hmm You're supposed to say nice to meet you, Pam. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, it is nice to meet you, Pam. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, too, Kevin. Well, first of all, can we just give you an add a girl on your accent? Yes. <laughs> Welcome, Lily. It's good to see you. Thanks, How are 
you. I should point out, you got off a plane, you flew from London because you're doing a play out there. You came uh -huh. to New York just for a little quick uh, junket here, and you're going back again. I am rushing back, but so happy to be here. You have, an, uh, you have, a, you're doing two shows a day. Well, we do two on Thursday and Saturday. And so tomorrow you have tomorrow a tomorrow. There's one. <laughs> so you're going to fly back tomorrow to London to do yeah. your show. Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk about your accent just for a minute? Yes. Because I was just so enthralled by that. It's not easy to pick up a Texas accent. No. As I'm I, from, I sit next I'm to from someone Austin. from Texas. Uh -huh. so, so how oh did you do it? <laughs> well, I just watched Friday Night Lights constantly. <laughs> and, I, and there was a point where I was like, okay, I'm just watching this because I'm obsessed with the show. Totally. I'm listening to the accent. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but did you work with a dialect coach? Yes. You I have did. an amazing dialect coach, Liz, who I use on everything. And I really rely on her. She's so brilliant. Well, you and Zac Efron, that, that is such an incredible pairing. And this this movie is getting so such rave and reviews. Incredible reviews. Incredible. Tell us about your role at playing Pam. Well, yeah, I play Pam, who, so it's about this, the Von Erich family, all boys, all wrestlers that rose to kind of rock star status in the sport. And it's all through the eyes of Kevin Von Erich. And I play Pam, who meets Kevin at one of his wrestling matches. They fall in love, they get married, the rest is history. Um, but it's an amazing story with, and they go through such unspeakable tragedy. And uh, the real Kevin and Pam are still together. And we really wanted mm. to pay homage to that relationship. You know, the fact that they've lived through such tragedy, come out fighting, I think it's incredible incredibly inspiring mm. so did you get to meet her or talk with her because it's one thing to mm -hmm. play somebody that's fictional now you yeah. the last two roles which have been incredible yeah. parts for you have been real yeah human and both Pam yes and both <laughs> Pam you have a thing for Pam I haven't met her but um Zach there's amazing pictures from the LA premiere of all the boys with Kevin Von Erich and it's so special Ooh. apparently he loved the film and I would love to meet her I yeah. hope I will still one day Zach Efron's an incredible actor and, and, and just a nice person yeah. we mm. met him on several occasions what's it like working opposite him uh, it really is. He's just the greatest. He is so sweet and so incredible in this movie. I can't like say enough. I mean, we got to have such intimate, sweet scenes where they're falling in love and he's mm -hmm. kind of opening up to this whole other side of himself. But then the rest of the time, he's doing all the all that wrestling yeah. he's doing. Yeah. And he is, he is phenomenal in this movie. To get in that kind yeah, of shape. Yeah, because the internet did go kind of wild <laughs> yeah. because not only did he get in that type of shape, but he also had... That shag haircut. Mm -hmm. That haircut, Which yeah. the internet, I mean, look at that. That do. <laughs> look yes, at Tell him. us about that. You know, it's so funny, because before I met any of the boys, because all the brothers are amazing, I went in for a costume fitting, and I just saw rails and rails of, like, spandex <laughs> and tiny pants. I was like, thank goodness it's not for me. Um, and they all looked. They worked so hard. It was incredible. Were they working out on set? Like, it was both acting and then people yeah. guys pump. benching? You yeah, know? actually, there was, like, an old-school gym on the family ranch where we were shooting, and in, in between... Uh, takes, I'd see the guys there, but I just sort of got with a tiny dumbbell. And <laughs> you, were like, you were doing like <laughs> bird, just checking well, them out. Yeah. <laughs> you got such great accolades for the other role you played, the other Pamela Anderson. You called it one of the most pivotal roles for you. How so? I think it was just such a huge challenge, such a huge responsibility, which I really understood and I wanted to do her justice and the story justice. I cared so much about the story. So um, it was a kind of pivotal moment in my career, I think, and has really pushed me to want to keep taking on big challenges and yeah. stretching myself as an actor. And Because it yeah. has to be intimidating. Yes. It's like somebody oh everybody knew. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And people think they yeah. know part of that story. Mm. Um, we read that you make your own scent. Like you really oh, dive I into these. This. Is this true? Yeah. For yeah. each character, you create I a do. smell? Because, you know, I think every day when, you, when you're getting ready in the trailer or for my play, you spray it on and suddenly it kind of just takes you to a place, kind of like focuses you in and your sense is so seductive your yeah. scent so so um, you go somewhere like Bath and Body Works and make <laughs> yeah I just go around like every I either spray you know scents already you know made, made and or I'll create one and put one together yeah I love that we you, you seem very like educated and credible and I love that you love reality TV that's one of your favorite things. Yes. reality dating shows yeah. what's your favorite uh, the bachelor a bachelor in paradise I mean I'm obsessed did like, you watch so the golden now? bachelor I, the, I haven't seen it because I was doing a play and I was like I have to focus <laughs> on my job but I did watch bachelor in paradise at the same time sad none of them are still together uh, oh we didn't even know that <laughs> sorry is that spoiler no no no, no, no. well we were not bachelor yeah. I mean we could be but we aren't oh. yeah um Lily you are incredible 
sweet. This role is remarkable. Thank, Thank you. you so much for flying in the midst of your run. I can't believe you're going back to London to star in your You're play. such a hard worker. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, any chance to come to New York and see you guys. Oh, Thank so you. Nice. Thank you're you invited so back whenever. <laughs> the Iron Claw hits theaters on Friday. Coming up next, are you ready to shop the drop? Oh, Tracy Ellis Ross shares her beauty secrets with Xana and has something special for our viewers just ahead right after this. Thank you. To one of our favorite people on the planet. We're talking about Tracy Ellis Ross. We talk about her all the time. And E-Style host and milk makeup founder, Zana Roberts Rossi, sat down with her oh. for our series, Shop the Drop. Wow. Uh, she is amazing. And at 51 years old, Tracy Ellis Ross says she's living the life of authenticity. I caught up with her at the beauty mogul store, David Mallet Salon at the Webster store in Soho. Let's talk about her life as a boss mm -hmm. and how she's found happiness. <laughs> Take a look. When she's not busy acting, producing, directing, Tracy Ellis Ross is changing the hair game. I was lucky enough to sit down with her in New York City, and she's got something for you guys. Are you ready to shop the drop? Award-winning entrepreneur, CEO, founder, fashion icon. Is that me? That is you. The award-winning actress wrapped an eight-season run on Blackish last year. She's a tireless advocate, hair entrepreneur, and her mother just happens to be one of the most iconic women ever, Diana Ross. What did your mom teach you about hair from a young age? I used to hide in her quick change booth and watch her do her makeup and... Because um, she did her own makeup all the time. But she still does her own hair and makeup. And so that's what I watch. It's funny, I sometimes think I'm being very new in when I discover that I like a fashion mm. or beauty and then I'll find an old picture of my mom and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> she's a, literally she's done it. <laughs> I'm like, well, oh well, oh well, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of beauty, it was more about the internal. It's mm -hmm. how you care for yourself. I think one of the best beauty secrets I have is laughter. You know, a smile on your face will change everything. Yeah. When you're not feeling 100% confident, how do you fake it? One of the things that I have taught myself is actually to not fake it, because part of my what I have to share with the world that I've gotten clear about is my authenticity and my Absolutely. truth and my transparencies. Mm -hmm. I'm in this hormonal shift at 51 years old and sometimes sleep is really hard to yeah. come by. Sometimes my emotions are just different. My body is my safest place for me and it feels foreign right, right. now, a little different. And so I've made a pact with myself that I don't have to pretend I'm somewhere that I'm not. Last time you were on the show, mm -hmm. they were asking what was on your wish list. Yeah. One what of is. them was a book, uh -huh. and one of them was a relationship. Oh, yeah. How are we doing on those counts? Ah, really well. <laughs> yeah, things are good. Excellent. Things are good, can't complain. I've made progress. Have you, on which one? <laughs> I'm, I'll just say I've made progress. One of Tracy's happiest places in this new chapter is as founder and CEO of Pattern Beauty. When Girlfriends finished, yeah. I wrote my first hair care brand pitch, which really laid out what I wanted the brand to be. And from then until the beginning of Pattern yeah. was 10 years. But part of what that journey and all those no's and difficult moments allowed me was to really focus my vision. You say hair is the portal to one's soul. Yes. What does this mean? I feel like I could chronicle my journey of self-acceptance through my journey with my hair. And so 
As I became more accepting of, learned my hair, understood my hair, mm -hmm. I was starting to learn and understand myself. My hair has connected me to my legacy. It's connected me to my family, to my history, to who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. Beauty, unfortunately, used to market things to women mm -hmm. by telling us what we didn't have to sell us a solution. Yeah. You flip that on the head. Our mission statement is that we exceed the needs of the curly, coily, and tight textured community. And our content is centered around the celebration of black beauty. Right. Those two things are inextricably tied. Mm -hmm. I don't believe hair has a race or a gender. Agreed. So curly, coily, or tight textured, you could be anybody. And so it's been really important to me that all of the language we use is from a place of celebration as opposed to a place of shame. So on that note, it was time for a crash course on how Tracy celebrates her signature curls every day. Welcome to the Pattern Salon. I'm your stylist, Tracy Ellis Ross. Please, please. Why, thank you, Tracy. Yes, please. This is what I described as my ideal okay. hair-like scenario. So this hydration shampoo. What's oops. your technique? I try and pretend I'm in a salon and somebody's doing it for me. While the conditioner is in my hair, I use the shower brush. Then I rinse this out with low water pressure Why? and freezing cold water. It's sadistic. very good for this. I go, huh, huh. You don't want the water pressure to break those curls apart. Oh, wow, this is real science. It's going real science. Physics. Mm -hmm. Do you have a saying in the show? Absolutely. If it's magic, then why can't it be everlasting? Like a headdress. Like the sun that always shines. Like a poet's endless rhyme. I don't know the other words. <laughs> Drop the mic. Hoda and Jenna, are you ready to shop my drop? Shop my drop, shop my drop. I oh, mean, we are ready. Every time oh, we think we couldn't we love, love her anymore, her. we fall more and more madly you, in love with her. Was it magic just talking to her? She's the most real, the most funny, the confident, and she just owns herself. Oh. A ball oh, of energy. All right, so Tracy's giving us two exclusive deals. Are, Are we ready, ready to shop the, the drop? Oh, talk to us. Okay, so we've got two deals here. Now, one, two bundles, I should say. So for the first one is a wash bundle. So this is the ultimate nourishing wash kit for anyone who needs Is this what she was singing into? This is basically all the products <laughs> she was singing into. Okay. So we have a hydration shampoo, which is super nourishing. It contains honey and coconut mm. oil. Then we have an amazing conditioner. And then also the leave-in conditioner, which she swears by as the ultimate hair rehab. Okay. And then it also has this fantastic brush. brush, which is, you know when you're brushing the conditioner through the hair? Yeah, yeah. You want it to glide through kindly yes. without ripping hair? Yes, that's, that's the one it. for that. And it has this fantastic little hole there that you can hang, hang it in the shower. Good. Very Amazing. Clever. Everything about the line is very good. Okay, tell us about the heat bundle. Okay, the heat, let me tell you the price on that one. Oh. So this is $94 retail. We are getting it for 50% off for $47. Wow. That's $47. Good. That's good. $47. Okay, and then this we have the patent hair dryer. This is our heat styling blow dry set. This would retail the whole thing at 229. We are getting it for 148. Wow. This is an award-winning hair dryer. It has four different attachments and it literally is a piece of art. It looks so beautiful. It's beautiful. And what then this fantastic yeah. brush, which is the perfect one to give you a big blowout. And obviously the one that she uses as a mic. <laughs> and then this is a fantastic heat seal because it actually works on any type I of like hair. like those kind of sprays. Oh yeah. my gosh, she has. Wow. And those people are, are awesome. obsessed with these products. They're gonna go fast. Yes. They're Gonna so go they're really going to go fast. fast. What great gift. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Zana. Thanks, Zana. Thank you, and to get, um, to get these exclusive pattern beauty bundles by Tracy Ellis Ross, head to today.com slash shop or scan that QR code. Right here. All right. Coming up next, not sure what to wear for your New Year's Eve party. Summer House's Paige DeSorbo has some affordable holiday dresses for all of us right after this. Good job, Thank Zana. You guys. Zana.
Whether it's an office get, get together, a cocktail party, or a New Year's Eve bash, holiday events can really break the bank, especially when it comes to wardrobe. Yeah, so we brought in style expert Paige DeSorbo to show us some holiday dresses for under a hundred bucks. Paige is a cast member on Bravo's Summer House and the co-host of the Giggly Squad podcast. Girl, Hi, so Paige. Wait, these Hi. are all for real under a hundred? Yes, all for real. Okay, let's start with an office party. <laughs> yes. Because when you're at an office party, you want to yeah. look great. We yes. have Phyllis who's here. Tell us about Phyllis's look. Oh, I'm oh my gosh. sorry. Phyllis. Dude, as can be. We love the silver metallic, but also for office parties, you want to be able to wear it somewhere more fun than an office party. Yeah. So she can wear that dress again. We just put a white button up underneath, makes it off the sea. And That's Phyllis cute. loved yeah. these shoes, didn't she? She yes. wanted to, she's keeping them. She loves we them. heard those shoes are sort of the hit shoe of the season. Amazon metallic is never out wow. of style, in my opinion. And a silver monochromatic metallic, I think, just looks chic. I love I'd that. like to remind people that Phyllis was a police officer at one point, and now she has this whole brand new profession. And by the way, Phyllis is also, it. we don't pick favorites, but she might be our <laughs> yeah, favorite yeah. model no, around You should here. hear her backstage. Yeah. She's literally the she, life of the party. Yeah, she's the queen. <laughs> All right, thanks, um, Phyllis. Okay, so moving on to cocktail dresses. Yeah. There's a lot of cocktail parties this time of year. Wow. Yes. This is our beautiful Gorge. staffer, Victoria. Victoria, cute as Let's can talk be. Let's talk about people clapping from all angles. Of course. Let's talk about this beautiful silhouette. So red is obvious. Obviously having a moment. The holidays, we love a little shoulder, yeah. we love a sleeve. But here's the best part. So her black pumps, I actually added shoe clips Wait. from Amazon. You're yes. so good. Get a pack of shoe clips, re changes up your normal heels. You can wear them again, you can wear them with different outfits and just Ooh, simply cool. changing one thing. And her that. dress is H&M under $100. And Red is having such a moment, she'll wear this again. Yeah, you definitely will. You look gorgeous, All gorgeous. Right. Thank, Thank you. you, beautiful. All right. Let's have a girls' night out. Let's I think that would be fun. Night. We need We've it. We've got Chanel. Is that I right? Mean, Hi. She's I'm in. Oh, wow. Look how wow. She, look how how she first she of all, cool. yes. your confidence. We look love at her. it. Okay, so it's all about the lace tight right now. Um, so take a little black blazer dress that you already have. You don't have to break the bank. Add different accessories to make it very New Year's Eve, to make it very holiday. Look at her gorgeous bag, matches her. Um, earrings, and then we throw on a glove. Wait, where did you get the lace tights and the lace gloves? So the lace tights and the lace gloves and the lace bodysuit underneath are all a set that I got from a small business, yeah. and they all match. And then we just added a blazer dress How to great it. is that? A blazer that? dress. Yes. That is the cutest. You look gorgeous. Oh my gorgeous. gosh. Have we fun love that party. All black for New Year's. We live in New York. We need all black. Yeah, yeah. awesome. You look beautiful. Okay, Thank finally, you. also black tie New Year's. There's people yes. that are going to parties. Love Look at we Brooke. have our staffer, Brooke. Tell us about this. Brooke look. is I adorable. It, Brooke. I'll put her in my pocket. Love it. Um, I love navy blue for the holidays. I think it's a little bit different than your yes. normal silvers and gold yeah. that you're going to see on New Year's Eve. So we went black tie. We went navy blue. We did a silver heel. And then we matched her bag with her cute little faux fur jacket. And we I added a bow that. in the back for her hair to make it extra oh, holiday. Bo is wait, having yeah. a moment. Bo's well, having, having a moment. Brooke, you might have to turn one more time. And you for can that buy bow. that bow on Amazon. Yeah, right? that's where we got it. Or make it, you know, reuse those bows. Yeah, so the, I can't believe these are all under hundred dollars. Yeah. Just bring everybody back out so yeah. we can take one last look. Beautiful, beautiful. I want to go to that party. I, I know, too. me too, Paige. Let's go. <laughs> you guys look so cute. You all are gorgeous, Thank Paige. You. Thank you Thank so, you so, so much. Paige. Happy, Happy holidays. You can catch Paige, by the way, on the new season of Summer House, premiering early next year on our sister network, Bravo, and all the previous seasons, of course, are streaming on Peacock. Coming up next, Frosty the Snowman is here with an early Christmas surprise for one of our Plaza friends. Oh. When we play <laughs> Suddenly Santa. Come on, Gerard.
it's the holidays and snow is falling, so let's go snowballing. Hey, enough of this stalling. It's suddenly Santa. <laughs> okay, it is time. Look at this. I'm excited. It's time for Suddenly Santa when we make a plaza fancy a little bit brighter. Here to play is Barb Summerick. She's from Alpena, Michigan. She is here with her sister-in-law, Lori. Oh. And she is pumped up, JBA. Okay, we know. And Barb, we know you've got this. Okay, but this is how it's going to work. Okay. You have that bucket of snowballs right there. You're going to have 30 seconds mm -hmm. to toss them into these red buckets over here. And however many balls you get in will determine the box you get. So if you get one ball, you'll open this one, two, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to six, and the gifts get a little, a little bit, bit better. A little bit more exciting. Okay, yeah. so Barb, why don't you go over there, stand okay. there on the line, okay? And I'm gonna pull this candy cane, and as soon as I pull, why don't you take a couple in your hand, okay. and then you can start throwing them, okay? And go, Barb! You got it, Barb! You got it, girl! One, one two, two, keep going! Two, three! Keep going, keep going! <laughs> keep going, Barb! You know what your sister-in-law kept yelling? Think, Think of, of cornhole. Oh. Come here, come here, okay, Barb. Barb. Come right over here. <laughs> you you got one ball, then you got two, then you got three, then you got four, then you got five. Finally, you got all. You got the, you got the big prize. Balls. What is the big Should prize? Should we see what's in the yeah, box? Let's see. It is sunglasses. Sunglasses. Do you know what these sunglasses mean? I do not. <laughs> you can take them <laughs> with you on vacation. Woo! She's going. Take a listen. You're going to Mexico. My Thanks to place. Apple Vacations, you'll enjoy a four day, three night trip for two to the <laughs> all inclusive so Ryu Caribe Resort in Cancun. My the resort place. is home to restaurants, bars, beautiful beaches, and a spa. Thank Round trip so airfare included. Happy traveling. Yay! It's the best. Yes. Oh Hi, my God, Lori. Lori is I, don't so know, crazy. I don't know if she's bringing me. I'm just. Who are you mom. taking? We'll see. I don't know yet. You have time. You have time to decide. I'm on the nice list. I'm on the nice list. She, I don't know. She right. might have to take her husband or somebody else. My brother is her husband. Oh. Yeah. oh. oh her His name's okay. Bob Christopherson. <laughs> Mexico. Okay, congratulations. Thank you so much. We adore you and we'll be back right after Thank this. Thank you. Lovely, wonderful people out in the rain, but here enjoying New York City. Oh, it's actually love them. It's a warm day, 60 degrees. I know. Here. Look at how to always find the positive. Oh, the gale force oh, winds. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Cynthia <Don't even. laughs> Riva will be here tomorrow, and not not surprised for a group of high school besties. Bye. <laughs> Take my electricity down. We're celebrating our girl Jenna Bush Hager. Go read. Me. It's so good. Are y'all still happy your daddy's home? Yes. There's Jenna. She's not afraid to be herself. <laughs> love you, Jenna. I love you. I love you.
Season's greetings from the Today All Day Kitchen. The holidays are all about getting together with friends, family, and of course, enjoying some amazing food. Today, we're whipping up three tasty dishes to make your celebrations extra special this year. I'll show you the secret to making the best latkes you've ever had in your life. And my cheesy spinach gratin is the perfect party side. And my flavorful brisket braised in red wine makes a decadent holiday centerpiece. I'm Alejandra Ramos. I'm Jake Cohen. I'm Jocelyn Delk Adams. And this is Today Food All Stars. Let's get this holiday party started. Even if you don't celebrate Hanukkah, this recipe is a must for any holiday feast. I mean, seriously, who doesn't love crispy fried potatoes? It's traditional to celebrate with greasy foods around Hanukkah because it's the miracle of the eight nights and we celebrate with lots of oil. These latkes are hands down the star of the show. Let's get started with our potatoes and onion. I have two russet potatoes and I'm gonna use about a quarter of this yellow onion. Really, you're looking for a pound of potatoes. And obviously it's not required for the recipe, but ugly Hanukkah sweaters are encouraged. We have to get in on the holiday fun, just like the rest of you. Now we are going to grate. I have a box grater. We're gonna be using the coarse holes. It's a bit of an arm workout, not gonna lie. But listen, we're eating fried foods. We gotta balance this out with a little exercise. I have a bowl here that I've lined with cheesecloth. I'm gonna throw this in. And it's just gonna help us squeeze out all of the liquid because what is the enemy of fried food? Water. That'll make it soggy. And nobody likes soggy latkes. And we're going to squeeze out all of the water from this. Really give it a good squeeze. When you think you got it all out, give it one more tug. You see all this here? This would not give you crispy latkes. This would give you sad, limp latkes. Awesome, okay. This is gold right here. Please do not dump this into your sink just yet. We are going to put this to the side and I'm gonna tell you all about why you got to be saving your potato liquid. But we'll get to that in a second. For now, I'm gonna grab another bowl and we're gonna start mixing together our latkes. Little bowl with our ball of potato and onion. And now you don't need a lot more. I'm gonna throw in a quarter cup of matzo meal. You could also use flour. You could use breadcrumbs. I'm gonna crack in two eggs. And two teaspoons of kosher salt. Now we're just gonna to start to mix this all up. It comes together pretty quickly. You get a little messy, but that's kind of the fun of this. That's why I'm wearing my ugliest sweater, of course, because if we had a little latke or grease on it, I'll, I'll live. So I have this bowl of liquid here. I'm gonna walk over to the sink and pour off the liquid. What you're gonna find stuck to the bottom is a thin layer of potato starch. This we're gonna add back into our latkes. It's gonna help bind and make them extra, extra crispy. This is the gold, the secret ingredient for the crispiest latkes. It's gonna add more starch to bind it together and get extra golden in the pan. Voila. It's the weirdest thing. It feels so weird in your fingers, but it's the secret. I'm telling you right now. You're never gonna just throw out that liquid ever again now that you found all of this magic that gets stuck to the bottom of your bowl. We're ready to fry now. I'm going to preheat a cast iron pan. I love cast iron because it's thick. It really helps get a nice golden crust. But we're going to throw in a quarter inch of vegetable oil. This pan's gonna fit three latkes because you need to make sure you give enough space so that when you smash it, they don't all meld together. Uh, but really, no more than four per batch. Nothing is worse than dropping it in and you don't hear any noise. If you don't hear any noise, you're just gonna end up with super greasy latkes. Let's go in. I got my third of a cup scoop. I'm gonna drop all of my scoops first. Gorgeous sound. We love to hear it. And now directly after, you got your spatula, and we're gonna give it a nice old smash. 
it goes pretty quickly. You're really only gonna need about two minutes per side. The key part is at a medium high heat, we want that nice golden color. All right, let's take a look at the other side. Also nice and golden. This is ready to drain. I'm gonna throw this right to a sheet pan lined with paper towels. This is just gonna help get out any excess grease so it stays nice and crispy. All right, let's do this. All right, the latkes are all fried. You wanna have them while they're hot, so I'm gonna grab my platter and we're gonna start eating them while they're fresh. Okay, time for our latke party. We have our freshly fried latkes, now toppings. We have a lot to talk about. I grew up in an applesauce family. Many are of the belief that sour cream is better. You do you. I think there is no one that is better. It is whatever you love, whatever brings out the most nostalgia from your childhood. Boom. Are you ready for the crunch? Mmm. Brings me right back to standing at the stove while my mom fried latkes. I'm telling you, even though I've taken over latke frying duty, it still brings up that same cozy vibe. This is the ultimate Hanukkah recipe. You need it at your holiday feast. Nothing like a perfect latke. Happy Hanukkah, everyone. I hope you have eight crazy nights full of tons of perfect crispy latkes. Up next, Jocelyn Delk Adams is making her creamy spinach gratin. This spinach gratin might not be super traditional, but just trust me when I say that it takes any veggie casserole to the next level. This dish has become a family favorite that keeps people coming back for seconds and thirds. To get started, we're going to add some chopped onion. And the thing about this recipe is I have actually quite a bit of garlic. I've got cloves, I've got garlic powder. I mean, can you tell I love garlic? I bet you can. But I just love the flavor that it imparts in a dish and it just, it just gives it so much depth. And I mean, hey, who doesn't love garlic? Okay. All right, so we're gonna melt our butter down. It's starting to melt down now. And we just wanna saute this until it's sort of tender and translucent. About 
four to five minutes or so. And kind of stir occasionally, get it in all that delicious butter. And now I'm gonna add in our garlic, and this is only going to cook for just maybe 30 seconds. You definitely don't wanna burn garlic. Give that a stir in here. While our garlic is finishing up, we're going to get some flour in here that's actually gonna start to become a thickener for our gratin, and it's gonna bring all of the ingredients together. Sprinkle that right in. All right, so now that our paste has sort of developed here, we are going to add in our liquid. We've got some half and half. And I'm gonna pour this in slowly and continue to whisk so all of the ingredients will sort of come together as quickly as possible. I wanna make sure that all of that is just blended super well and nice and incorporated. So now you can start to see that it's thickening up and bubbling, and that's our nice thick sauce that's developing here. And now I'm gonna add in some seasoning. I've got some Italian seasoning that I'm gonna add in. I've got some onion powder and garlic powder that's gonna go in. I've got some nutmeg, which seems a little unexpected because you're thinking, we're not baking pie. Like, what's that doing in there? But I love the incredible flavor that it lends to this. And then I've got some cayenne as well. Because I like that kick. Y'all know I love some spice. And then I'm just gonna mix all of this together. I'm gonna add in some softened cream cheese, and I'm gonna start to let that sort of break up into this cream sauce. Oh, y'all. This is what the holidays are all about. Bring on the cheese and all the creaminess and all the lusciousness. So we're just gonna mix this in and let it sort of melt down. And it's important that it's softened because if it's not and it's super cold coming from the refrigerator, this is gonna take a really long time and it's gonna be incredibly hard for it to blend into your sauce. There we go, it's breaking down beautifully. So now we're gonna add in more cheese, right? It's the holidays. We can't play around. We gotta make this super decadent. So we've got two different types of cheeses. I've got some shredded Parmesan and I'm gonna add that right in to our sauce here. And then I also have like an Italian blend of cheeses. You will start to see like this become like a huge mess of cheese and that's exactly what we want folks, okay? So now I'm going to add in the star of the show, some spinach, we gotta add the spinach. So into our mixture this goes. All right, and then we're just going to mix this in to our mixture here with the cheese and get it super duper coated, nice and coated here. And then we're just gonna cook this until it's slightly warmed through because it's gonna go in the oven. So I'm just gonna add a little salt and pepper and taste it and if it's perfect, we're gonna get it ready to bake. And now we are going to assemble this for baking. I have a casserole dish here and you can use, you know, as, as deep as you like or as shallow as you like. It's totally how you want to serve this. And I'm gonna use some nonstick cooking spray and I'm just gonna coat the inside so it's super greased. All right, and then I'm gonna add our spinach directly into here. Oh yeah, that's so good. So good. Okay. So now that I have our spinach in here, I'm just going to add some additional cheese to the top because I clearly haven't added enough cheese here. So we need more cheese. Adding right to the top here. 
So I've got more of our Italian blend along with some shredded Parmesan that I'm adding to the top. And then I'm going to add some panko. So now this is going to bake in the oven at 375 for about 15 to 20 minutes. So this is just absolutely perfect. You can see the golden color on top and you can see all that crunch and deliciousness and you know the spinach and that creaminess below is so worth it. Delicious. Um, I might take another serving. Sorry. Oh my gosh. And this is what the holiday season is all about. I seriously could just serve this and everyone would be happy, okay? It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's incredible. Creamy texture, it's well seasoned and balanced. You've got that hen and nutmeg that I told you about. That's coming through. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. I am definitely getting into the spirit. This flavorful brisket is one of my favorites for entertaining family and friends because it doesn't require much active cooking time at all. All you have to do is combine all of the ingredients and basically let the oven do all that heavy lifting. We're gonna get started by making our spice rub for the brisket and there's a lot of great flavors going into this. We've got smoked paprika, salt, some oregano, and a little heat from chili flakes. It's really simple. All you want to do is a little small bowl and then add your ingredients in. I'm going to do three tablespoons of salt. And this is kosher salt, which is really great for a rub like this. Three tablespoons of smoked Spanish paprika, which if you've been watching the show, you know I love. It's smoky, so flavorful and works really well with that red wine we're gonna be adding later. Now we're gonna do some black pepper, a couple teaspoons of that. Two tablespoons of dried oregano. Just gonna shake that in. Don't worry, we get a little bit extra in. This is totally forgiving. 
And finally, a little bit of heat from those crushed red chili flakes. I'm gonna do half a teaspoon. I'm real generous though, because I like it spicy. Use a fork or a little whisk just to mix it all up. Make sure that all those spices are evenly incorporated in here. You basically want to see like a nice, even distribution of everything that's in the bowl. All right, that looks fantastic. Now we're ready to add it to our brisket. So for the brisket, we're using a five pound cut of meat. You can go a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, whatever works for your party size. And then what we're gonna do is just add all of this onto the meat and rub it on. I want you to start with the fat side down because we're gonna put this all on this side of the meat, then flip it over when it goes into our pan. So we're gonna start like this and do about half of that. And just rub it in, to kind of push it into the meat. Make sure you get it on all the sides. So much good flavor here. I'm smelling that paprika, I'm smelling those fresh herbs. This is really gonna infuse our meat with amazing flavor. And as it cooks, that flavor is just gonna come out. The meat is gonna become so tender. I mean, this is a fantastic dish for entertaining. I'm gonna give it a nice little flip, put it into the pan with that fat side up, and then I'm gonna go ahead and toss the remaining amount of the rub. Just spread it in. Anything that falls into the pan is perfectly fine. That's just gonna become part of the delicious braising cooking liquid. Beautiful. Amazing. That already smells like a party. This is a braised brisket. And what braising means, it's you're taking a piece of meat or veggies, whatever you're cooking, and cooking it slowly in liquid. So for our liquid for this is gonna be some broth, some red wine, and then we have a few aromatics. I'm doing a couple onions. These are Spanish onions. This is really just about adding a little bit more flavor to our broth, so it's very, very simple. We're really just gonna scatter these pieces around the side of our brisket. So just toss them in, no fancy chopping or cutting needed. Now some garlic, a lot of garlic, that's how I cook. We've got about 12 cloves here. Do as many as you want. You can do more, you can do less. And we're just gonna smash them up a little bit. Basically, I wanna open them up so that as they braise, that flavor kinda comes out easily. Use the flat side of my knife and push. There we go, a little crushed right into the pan. And just repeat with the rest of the cloves. And the last one, perfect. So now we're gonna work on our braising liquid, which is a mixture of broth and wine. I'm gonna go grab that wine. For this, you wanna use a dry red wine. I've got a Spanish Tempranillo here, which is probably one of my favorites. I really always love those Spanish flavors when I'm cooking. So it would be delicious if I poured it into a glass, maybe slightly smaller than this one, uh, and it's gonna be delicious in your food. Pouring all that wine in. We're using the whole bottle. To this, we're also gonna add some tomato paste. Just one whole can of that. It's gonna go right in with the wine. We're gonna whisk that in. And I like using tomato paste for this because it's already this really sweet, concentrated flavor. So use a whisk just to kind of gently stir that in. All right, that looks good. And so now we're gonna pour in our braising liquid. I wanna make sure that that rub stays on the meat. So when you pour, just pour along the outside, just like that. I wanna make sure those flavors stay on the meat as long as possible. Good. And now we're gonna add our broth. And for this, you can use any kind of broth you'd like. I love a really flavorful kind of beef or chicken bone broth. Okay, so this is ready to go into the oven. Before we pop it in, I do want to cover it with some foil. The foil is going to help trap all those delicious flavors and that steam in there, keep things really moist during the long cook time. Okay, so that's covered. Now it's ready to go in the oven. We're going to braise it for five to six hours at 350 degrees. And then while we wait, I'm gonna open up a second bottle of that wine.
This smells amazing. The brisket has been braising for six hours. Let's see how it looks. Ta-da! This is exactly what I was hoping for. You'll see the brisket has shrunken up a little bit. It's very tender. All those flavors are concentrated. And we've got those little garlic cloves that we tossed in. Now they're really, really tender. You wanna grab a fork. And then what we're gonna do is you're just gonna go in and smash them, sort of dissolve them right into that braising liquid. This is gonna add incredible flavor to the sauce. So remember, I told you to cook this fat side up. The reason for that is because as it braises, that fat renders and falls down into the meat, making it extra tender. But there is some of it that does remain even after all this cook time. And what you wanna do is hold onto your pan and then just kind of pull back. You'll see how that fat easily comes right off the meat. You just scoop it up. Now we are ready to shred our brisket. So for this, I'm just gonna use two forks and it's a really, really simple process. You just kind of stick that fork in there and just start pull with the opposite one. See how it shreds beautifully? This is so, so simple. And one of the great things about doing it right in the pan with all this delicious cooking liquid in there is that it is basically kind of mixing itself right into that sauce. All right, this looks so good. So I'm gonna do one quick little taste. Mm. Amazing. I'm gonna add a little bit more salt. All over. And then some black pepper. All right, so before we serve this, I do like to do one little finishing touch. I love the little crispy bits of meat when it cooks on the fire. So what I do is after I shred, pop it under the broiler for just a couple minutes. You're gonna get all those little crispy edges. So delicious. All right, so now we're gonna plate it up. And you can serve this with any sides that you want. I love sweet potatoes because I think that the sweetness of the sweet potatoes works really well with the savory meat. And because it's the holidays and I love an accessory, we're gonna add some pomegranate jewels right on top. Look how pretty these look. They just add gorgeous color and a little bit of fresh cilantro. All right, I'm ready to taste. Mm. What a perfect meal for our holiday feast. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. Are you ready for a sweet treat this holiday season? It's been one crazy year. So today we're dishing up our favorite anything party. I'm kicking things off with my ginger lemon crinkle cookies. I'm baking up traditional Puerto Rican holiday cookies, polvorones. And I'll be baking up my gluten-free macaroon brownies. I'm Jake Cohen. I'm Alejandra Ramos. I'm Jocelyn Delk Adams. This is Today Food All-Stars. It's time to get baking. Growing up, my family always made cookies together during the holidays. One of my favorite recipes was gingerbread, so this is an ode to a real Christmas classic. My recipe uses zesty lemon for a unique twist. Getting creative in the kitchen is a sweet tradition that I want to pass down to my daughter. So I can't wait to share this crinkle cookies recipe with you. So let's get started on our dough. I'm gonna start by blending together our dry ingredients. I've got some flour here. I'm gonna add this to our large mixing bowl. I'm going to add in some cinnamon and also some ginger. We've got a trifecta, if you will, of spices going into this that are really just going to elevate this cookie and give it so much life. Now I'm gonna add in some baking soda. 
and this is gonna give our cookies just a nice lift. And then of course you need some salt whenever you're baking. You think of sweets, you think of sugar, but you need that salt to truly balance out everything. Now I'm gonna add in our final spice here, some cardamom. So I really love adding these three flavors together in our ginger cookies because, you know, most times you'll just see ginger and cinnamon, but I think the cardamom is really lovely and just adds like a nice depth to these cookies. So just mix all of our ingredients here together and this will be ready to go into our batter. I've got some unsalted butter here, and this is room temperature, whether it be cakes or cookies. You wanna make sure that this is room temperature so all of the ingredients incorporate super well. So we're gonna cream the butter and the sugar together. And for that to happen, we have to break down that sugar and really get it to dissolve into that butter. And then I'm gonna start mixing this up. All right, so now we're gonna add in one egg yolk. We're gonna mix that together and get that nice and creamy. So now we're going to add some lemon zest. I'm adding some citrus notes because I really feel like it brightens the recipe up some. Right. And then I'm going to add in some vanilla and make sure it's really pure vanilla extract. Mix that together. And now I'm gonna add in our molasses. And this is what gives ginger cookies that special flavor. So that's gotta go in there. And this is a little different from traditional gingerbread cookies. These are much softer, much chewier, you'll find like in general, because most of the other cookies are a little stiffer. And so I find that this is like melts in your mouth, super tender cookie. Okay, so now I'm going to turn our mixer down to a lower speed and add in our dry ingredients that we mixed together earlier. I'm adding this sort of slowly in increments because I really sort of wanna make sure that all of the dough incorporates pretty well. So once you see that it's starting to mix in, you can add in some more. And you can tell that it's getting very, very thick and that's exactly how we want our batter to look. And as soon as you see that pretty much everything is incorporated, then you can stop mixing. No need to overmix this. And you can do one more scrape of the bottom of the bowl. Make sure you get all those dry ingredients in there. So now we're going to stick this in the refrigerator to let it chill. Get that nice and covered. And let this chill for about an hour. All right, our dough is nice and chilled now. And here's sort of a rule of thumb. Once it's been in there for about an hour, you'll notice that it has firmed up a lot more and that's what we're looking for. We want it to be definitely cold to the touch. So we're going to work on the assembly process for our cookies. With crinkle cookies, you're going to start by scooping out some dough and then I'm going to take our ball of dough and then I'm gonna roll it right into the sugar, just making sure to coat it on all sides. And then we're gonna add to our baking sheet. And you wanna make sure that you keep these sort of spread out. About two inches is fine because you don't want them to sort of bake together. You wanna keep them nice and separate. I find that my daughter really loves this part because she helps me add our dough to the sugar. She loves sort of just rolling it around. She thinks it looks like snow. So it's a super fun idea and fun thing to do with the kids for sure during the holidays. So now these are ready to bake. I'm gonna pop them in the oven at 375 for about 10 to 12 minutes or until they get nice and crackly, but still soft in the centers. All right, our cookies look fantastic. 
I've let them cool down for a few minutes because you want them to still be warm and chewy. I'm gonna start plating these. Uh, and you can just smell all of those incredible spices in the air. It smells like the holidays, I'm telling you that. And they're like the perfect texture too, just soft and tender. Look how great those look. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love these cookies so, so much. I mean, they remind me of my childhood. They're so warm and cozy and comforting. And they just bring me back to memories of being with my family and baking during the holidays. Just such special times. The flavors are just incredible. From the Today All Day All Stars, happy holidays and Merry Christmas, everyone. Next up, Alejandra Ramos is making pulverones, a soft and crumbly Spanish shortbread. It's Alejandra. The name of these nutty shortbread cookies comes from the word polvo, which in Spanish means dust. That refers to the powdered sugar that coats the cookie, as well as the trademark crumbly texture. You may actually know these as Mexican wedding cookies or even Russian tea cakes. Many different cultures have their own version of this dessert and they're popular on holiday tables throughout the season. They actually also make a really great holiday gift. All right, let's get started by making our dough. So these cookies are almond cookies. It's one of my favorite flavors during the holidays and throughout the year. For these, we're gonna use ground almonds and you can actually buy them ground or make them from scratch. To make them, all you have to do is drop some almonds into your food processor. Once it's in your food processor, you wanna coarsely pulse until you get a nice coarse grind. Using the pulse button gives you much more control than just letting it spin. So what you're looking for is this really beautiful kind of coarse grind. You want to see a few little pieces of the almonds. This is gonna give you that wonderful crumbly polvo texture for the cookies. Now we're gonna cream our butter and our sugar. So whenever you're creaming butter, you wanna start with room temperature butter. Take it out of the fridge about half hour to an hour before you start baking. Now we're gonna add half a cup of granulated white sugar to this and then we're gonna let it go. I like to start off slow, and then go a little faster. About halfway through, use a spatula to kind of scrape down those sides. Make sure all that butter and sugar gets really evenly incorporated. Do 
beautiful. Now we're gonna add a little bit of flavor. For this, we're using almond extract and vanilla extract. Anytime you use an extract, be sure to use the pure extracts, the real ones. There's only a few ingredients, so you want every single one of them to be the best quality, the best taste. This smells like Christmas to me. Now we're gonna add a little bit of salt. Salt is also another key ingredient whenever you're baking. It just kind of has this really sort of synergistic effect and really makes the sweetness of the cookie pop. Okay, salt's in, the flavor's in, let's add flour. For this, we're using all-purpose flour. We're doing two cups. We're gonna do one cup of the ground almonds, so don't put this whole bowl in. I know it might be tempting, but we only need one cup. All right, so we're about there. You're looking for that dough to just kind of all come together. You can give it one more scrape. I feel good about this. I think we're there. Our dough is perfect. It is time to start shaping. So I'm just gonna get these guys out of the way. Get my surface ready to make some cookies. This is always the best part. So for this, I'm using a cookie scoop. You want about a tablespoon of dough each time. And all you have to do is you scoop, level it out a little bit, make a little ball, and set it down, then repeat. I'm setting these about an inch or so apart on my cookie sheet. You want a little bit of space, but these cookies are so foolproof and so forgiving. They don't really spread. When rolling these out, you can be very gentle with them very light, it doesn't need to be tightly packed or anything like that. These are good little fellas. It's good for the holidays, right? Like we've already got enough on our minds these days. We don't need high maintenance cookies. All right, so now we're gonna chill these cookies for about 15 to 30 minutes. It's gonna help it keep its shape once it bakes. All right, friends, we have waited long enough. These cookies have been chilling for 15 to 30 minutes. I'm about ready to pop them in the oven. They're gonna bake at 325 degrees for 20 minutes. These cookies look amazing. They smell even better. I took them out of the oven and let them cool for about 20 minutes. And now it's time to dress them up. We're gonna be using powdered sugar for this. And I just like to put it in a shallow pie plate or a bowl, anything like that. You kinda of wanna shake it out a little bit, get rid of those lumps. Just put a few heaping spoonfuls. Keep the sugar handy, cause we're gonna need more. So then you just wanna to toss the cookies around in the powdered sugar. I like to do a few at a time and then transfer them to your serving tray. Just work in batches until you get through the entire amount. So you just keep adding sugar until they are fully covered, looking like beautiful little dusty snowballs. These are so sweet and so good. So when I got married, I actually baked a ton of these and served them at my wedding, which was in January, so it was a winter wedding, because I'm Puerto Rican and my husband's family is Russian. So it was kind of like Russian tea cakes and polvorones, a little bit for both of us. It's kind of funny that our families are from completely opposite parts of the world and yet we both shared this one cookie. All right, that looks beautiful. <laughs> polvorones. There you have it. These look and smell wonderful. I want to show you the texture because we talked about polvo meaning dust because it's crumbly and dusty. Look how easily these break apart. It's beautiful little crumbly texture inside. And the best part? Mm. So buttery and delicious. Love that almond flavor. These are so good. I hope you love them as much as I do. Have a sweet holiday, everyone. Next up, Jake Cohen is sharing his favorite holiday dessert recipe, gluten-free macaroon brownies.
chocolate and coconut are a match made in heaven. And I love this brownie recipe because it's so freaking easy and unlike anything you've ever had. Who wants to spend all day in the kitchen when you could be enjoying the holiday festivities? These brownies are so rich, but they just happen to be gluten-free, so you'll have a dessert that even more people can enjoy. Let's get started with our brownie batter. The first thing we're going to do is make a ganache. If you've never heard of ganache before, it is chocolate melted with some kind of fat. Sometimes it's heavy cream. Today we're using butter. We're using equal parts. So I'm gonna take two sticks of butter, or eight ounces, and we're gonna put this into a double boiler. It's a lot of vocab today, I know, but we're gonna get there. I'm just going to get a nice simmer on a saucepan with some water. I'm gonna take off my bowl just to show you. It's only about an inch of water. We don't want the water touching the bowl. It's gotta be heat proof, of course, so metal or glass. And we are going to let steam slowly melt our butter and chocolate. Why do we do this? Well, chocolate is expensive, especially if you're using nice chocolate. Often, I do find that the risk of burning your ganache is higher than the reward of the speed. So taking it nice, low, and slow is always gonna be my preference. We want a nice, silky ganache. So I'm gonna drop in my butter. And now we have eight ounces of dark chocolate. It's actually nine, so this is gonna be my little chef snack. I'm gonna coarsely chop this up. So a chocolate bar is always gonna be my go-to. And I find that 70% cocoa is the magic number. Anything more could be a little bitter for people. So let's get everything else in a bowl. Again, easy, one bowl, drop it, whisk it, done. We're gonna start with our sugars. So granulated sugar is what gives that nice kind of crisp edge and that papery top to your brownies. A quarter cup of brown sugar, light brown sugar to be exact, is what's going to give that chew factor. We love chewy brownies. From there, we're gonna throw in four large eggs. I'm gonna do two tablespoons of cocoa powder. Now this adds more chocolate flavor, of course, but also it's a nice binder. Then coffee. Coffee, instant espresso in this case, adds a really nice complexity, slight bitterness, salt. Anything with sugar needs salt. Last but not least, in the same way that salt is the balance to sugar, vanilla is the balance to chocolate. A lot of vanilla extract is actually super important in any chocolate recipe. And now that that's all handled, I'm just gonna whisk this up. Take a look at this. It's so shiny, so decadent. Honestly, you're gonna wanna wear it like a face mask because it's just that gorgeous. And this is all of that chocolate goodness that's going to bind these brownies into a fudgy square of perfection. So now that's all melted, it is as simple as we pour one into the other. So here I have one cup of coconut flour. At the end of the day, we are adding coconut to the macaroon layer. Might as well double up and use flour. It just happens to be gluten-free, a great binder, and it makes it that much more enjoyable for everyone. Last but not least, we're gonna be adding in some chocolate chips. The reason I add chocolate chips is because one of the biggest fights I have with my mother is over brownies. She is a strong believer that there needs to be nuts in brownies, and I do not agree. I don't like nuts in my brownies. Keep them away. However, to make up for that, I want to add a little bit of texture. So since we have so much dark chocolate richness, I find that some milk chocolate chips add that little bite to your cooled brownie. So that is it for our brownie layer. We're going to layer this into our pan. I am using a nine by 13 baking dish. You could use glass, you could use metal, you could use ceramic. Truly, whatever you got, don't stress. I am lining it with parchment paper. And then we're gonna pop this into the fridge for about an hour while we make our coconut macaroon layer. While our brownie layer chills, we are going to make 
coconut macaroons. These are not French macarons, which are all of the rage. My version just uses a quick and easy meringue and tons of shredded unsweetened coconut. To get started, I have four large eggs here. We're going to separate the whites and the yolks. You only need the whites today. Save your yolks to throw into tomorrow's omelet. The key for separating eggs, I typically just crack it and then use part of the shell to catch that yolk. So we're gonna take our egg whites, pop it into the bowl of a stand mixer. And now when you're making meringue, it can be quite finicky. There are a couple of tips I have for you for success every time. You want to start to get kind of foamy, a little bit of bubbles before we start incorporating any other ingredient. This should only take about a minute, no more chunks of egg white here and there. Perfect, this is what you're looking for. I'm gonna take three quarters of a cup of sugar. I'm going to gradually add it to our egg whites while the motor is running and it's beating. So by incorporating the sugar slowly, it doesn't overwhelm the egg whites so it doesn't take forever to get nice and fluffy. Gradual, be gentle, delicate. Meringue is a delicate dessert, so you gotta treat it that way. I'm gonna throw in half a teaspoon of salt and one and a half teaspoons of vanilla. You might have heard the term stiff peaks if you've ever made meringue before. What that means is we're getting so much air incorporated that's almost marshmallowy, and when you take off the beater, the meringue is gonna stick straight up. So once we see that, that's when we know we're done to go. This is what I'm talking about. A little Jimmy Neutron hair meringue. That is what you need before we move on to our coconut. I'm a big fan in this type of unsweetened shredded coconut, sometimes sold as desiccated because it's very fine. I like this better for my macaroons because it is a nice mouthfeel and it slices very evenly. We're gonna be adding in 12 ounces to our meringue. Just get it combined and then you're done. Now that our macaroon layer is ready, I'm going to pull my brownie layer from the fridge and we are going to assemble this and bake. We're just gonna take our coconut macaroon layer and put it right on top. Get a nice even layer. Gorgeous. I'm gonna pop this into our 375 degree oven for 30 minutes. You just want it nice and golden on the top. That's it, no toothpick, just trust me, 30 minutes is all you need. And coming up, we will finish up these sweet treats that are going to be perfect for any holiday party. Now that our brownies have baked and cooled, we're gonna slice them up and get eating. Key part with anything in the brownie bar realm is you have to be patient and let it cool completely. If you rush, you're gonna end up with kind of some wonky cut bars. 
key trip whenever slicing brownies. Give your knife a wipe after every slice. Any kind of residue will really help drag and kind of make your brownies not so pretty. Big question I always get, can I make this in advance? Yes, you can make these a day in advance and they'll keep in the fridge beautifully. However, I love it fresh. Make it in the morning, have it cool all day. You can even pop it in the fridge. The fresher it is, the more delicious it will be. There is no wrong way when it comes to your plating, but I do love a little platter situation. Something that you can put out, have done in advance. So while you're dealing with dinner, dessert's done, plated, ready to go. I've plated up enough. I cannot wait any longer to give one a try. Oof. This is my ideal dessert, right here. The fudgy brownie, the chewy coconut. It's sweet, it's got the balance of richness. This is a holiday masterpiece. It's gonna be the star of whatever gathering you have this year. I hope you have a sweet holiday, everyone. This will definitely help you get there. That's a wrap. Today, All Day Kitchen. I'm Alejandra Ramos. I'm Jocelyn Delk Adams. I'm Jay Cohen, and this is Today Food All Stars. Comfort food can be pretty much anything that makes you happy. Today, we're making three dishes that are hearty, delicious, and super satisfying. I'm cooking up a decadent stovetop mac and cheese, and this is my all star take on my favorite comfort food pizza stuffed meatloaf. And I'm cooking a soothing chicken noodle soup with saffron. So grab your cozy clothes, take a moment to treat yourself, and let's get cooking. Who doesn't love macaroni and cheese? This dreamy dish is popular everywhere. Growing up, my mom would only make us that box mac and cheese when she didn't have time to cook, so it was a real treat for us. Now, I know the pre-made stuff cooks up quickly, but my stovetop mac and cheese is easy to make and even easier to eat. That's why this dish is my all-star comfort food. Now, when it comes to mac and cheese, you can really use any kind of cheese you want. What you do want to think about is that creamy meltability. So I love the cheddar for that. It's a great melting cheese. It really incorporates well into that sauce and gets really nice and creamy. I'm using a box grater to grate this, and I'm just going along those big sides to do it. Check that out. <gasps> Mountain of cheese, I love it. And now we're gonna do Parmesan. So Parmesan is obviously not a melting cheese. Parmesan is a hard cheese. Uh, it adds incredible flavor. You probably use it on top of your spaghetti. So basically you're thinking you want texture and then you want flavor. And this way you can get both. All right, now we have all our cheeses ready for our mac and cheese. So I've got some pasta water already boiling here, and then we're gonna add some flavor with salt. This is just kosher salt, and I like it salty like the sea. Just be super generous here. This is adding flavor to your pasta. If you cook pasta in boiling just plain water, it's gonna taste like nothing. So you wanna add that salt. So now we're gonna add our pasta. I'm using a small pasta shape for this. So these are the little shells, which reminds me of the kind my mom used to make me when I was a kid. Any kind of small pasta shape would work really well here. That looks good. So now we're gonna start our sauce. I've got a big pot on my stovetop. I have it up to medium high heat. You really want a nice big pot, because remember, we're making a sauce, we're adding all that cheese, and then we also need room for the pasta. So we're gonna start off with some butter. For this, I've got four tablespoons of butter. That's about half a stick, and that can just go right in. So just let it go. You want that butter to melt completely. I kind of like to let it dance around in there. And then we're gonna start making our roux. So the roux is essentially the base of the sauce. For this, I'm using one third of a cup of all-purpose flour. And I'm gonna use a whisk to get that flour completely incorporated into the butter, it smells really delicious right now. That butter is starting to toast up a little bit. 
the flour is getting nice and incorporated. This looks really good. And you just wanna let this go for like a minute or two. Basically, you wanna cook off the flavor of the flour and you want it to become a nice sort of like thick paste. All right, so we wanna check on our pasta to make sure it's ready. Let's see. Hey, little fella. Mmm, that was perfect. Not too cooked. We're gonna drain this now. So you always wanna make sure you drain your pasta really well. If you don't, that extra water is going to make your sauce way too thin. We really want it to be rich, creamy. It's mac and cheese after all. All right, so now we can finish off our sauce. So we've got that flour that we cooked down and we're gonna add the milk. For this, I've got four cups of whole milk and then we're just gonna pour in and you wanna do this slowly. So what I do is I whisk with one hand while I gently pour with the other and just incorporate it little bit by little bit. And you might notice that it'll kind of lump up a little bit. That's totally fine. Once you keep going, it'll thin out. I'm gonna incorporate it like this. And then just keep going, adding a little bit more at a time. All right, so the perfect way to find out that this is at the perfect texture is to do the spoon test. Or in this case, the spatula test. What you do is you dip your spoon or spatula, anything you want, into the sauce and you use your fingertip to brush it down the center. If it holds that line, see how it has that nice crisp line? That's how you know your sauce is creamy and ready. All right, so now that our sauce is ready, we're gonna add some flavor. This is a Spanish smoked paprika and what makes it so wonderful is that smokiness. Now we're gonna add some dry mustard powder. So I know this is a little bit of an unusual ingredient. I love dried mustard powder because it adds a little bit of tang and sharpness to our cheesy sauce. And now my favorite part, a little bit of heat. I love adding a kick with ground cayenne. For this, I'm gonna do a quarter teaspoon. And this is one of those things where it's up to you. If you like spice, go ahead and double it. All right, so now we're adding that cheese All right, and then you just wanna whisk until all that cheese is melted and smooth and completely incorporated into your sauce. All right, so our sauce is perfect, and now we can add our pasta. So you can just keep this at that nice low temperature the entire time when you add your pasta. That way, you're not gonna overcook it. Everything is gonna stay nice and smooth and rich and gentle. And now what you wanna do is you just wanna incorporate it in there, just fold it in, keep stirring. Oh, this looks so good. All right, so now that our mac and cheese is almost ready, time for one of the most important steps in any recipe you make, taste before you serve. This is the point where you can find out, is it too salty? Is it too spicy? Do I want more of any ingredient? So let's give it a try. Mmm, so good. I do want a little bit more salt. A little bit more salt. Maybe a lot more salt. And a little bit of black pepper. All right, so this is perfect. It's ready to serve. I'm sure you have hungry mouths ready to dive in, and this really is best straight off the stove. This is the ultimate comfort food dish for me. It's warm, it's cozy, it's got incredible flavor, so satisfying. It's a hug in a bowl. This is my perfect comfort food. Up next, Jocelyn Delk Adam shows us her twist on meatloaf. Don't wanna miss that.
Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. I'm Jocelyn Delk Adams, and this is Today Food All Stars. I came up with this pizza stuffed meatloaf when I lived in Chicago, so this recipe is truly a trip down memory lane. It's basically a deep dish pizza crossed with a meatloaf, and it's so much fun to make. I mean, who wouldn't want a meatloaf stuffed with gooey cheese? I'm gonna show you how to make it. I've got some ground beef here, but you can also use ground turkey if you prefer. And then I've got some pepperoni, okay? Who doesn't love pepperoni? I need all pepperoni on my pizza, so it's gotta go in my meatloaf too. So you can either chop this is like small or as big as you like. If you want bigger chunks, it's totally up to you. I like to take a few and sort of just chop them into smaller pieces. So I just start adding this directly into our meat here. Now we're gonna get started on our parsley here. And I'm just going to take these right off of the stems. And you don't need a ton but you just need enough to really sort of give this more of a fresher taste. Okay, and then I've got some garlic as well. We need to mince up about two cloves. If you like more garlic, you can definitely add more. Okay, so now I'm gonna add in two eggs. This is going to help bind all of those ingredients together. Now I'm adding in some seasoned breadcrumbs and these are Italian flavored because we're making pizza meatloaf. We gotta have that Italian flavor in there. So now I'm adding in some milk. Give this some nice moisture. And then we've got finally some extra seasoning. I've got some Italian seasoning. And I've got some seasoned salt. And now we're gonna add in a touch of black pepper. All right. And those are our ingredients. Now it's time to get our hands a little dirty. You wanna roll up your sleeves on this. And you can definitely just get in there. That's the thing about meatloaf. You really just wanna get in there. Okay. And once you've got everything mixed together, it's time to start the assembly. So, washed my hands and I am ready to actually assemble this meatloaf. So here I have a loaf pan that's lined with some parchment paper and then I'm just gonna add this directly into our pan. And then what I like to do is just leave a little right there because I'm going to start to move this, pushing it down into the center, creating a well with my fingers because that's where I'm going to add all of that delicious cheese that's gonna melt down later on. So just kind of push it along the sides, creating a well in the center of the meatloaf. I'm gonna add in our cheese. Do you see this? This is insane, y'all, crazy. And I'm using a shredded mozzarella. Do you love how I said that? I'm using shredded mozzarella here because we are making pizza after all, pizza stuffed meatloaf. So I'm gonna get that right into the well. And then I'm going to use this extra meat that I have left off to sort of just place over the top. And then I'm gonna start to connect it. so we can push that cheese down so it's sort of hidden. You get that fun effect of it being right in the center when you cut into it. So while our meatloaf is cooking, let's get started on our sauce. And we're gonna actually start with some pre-made pizza sauce because, you know, we're trying to keep all the effort down, right? I've got this on a medium heat to begin because I wanna get a nice simmer on it. And then I have a few ingredients that we're gonna to add to punch up the flavor. I've got some garlic powder. And then I've also got some red pepper flakes because I like a little spice. It's totally up to you though. 
And then I'm also gonna add in some parsley that we chopped earlier. And then I've got some oregano and I've got some basil, some dried ingredients that you can buy at the grocery store and store in your pantry. Ta-da! It's pretty magical, isn't it? <laughs> you can actually see some of that cheese that started to bubble on the top. I mean, oh my gosh, that looks sensational. So I'm just gonna use our flaps here and just start lifting it right up. That drip, oh my gosh. I'm gonna place it right here. And then just remove our parchment. Now we gotta add that sauce, y'all. Spoon it right over the top. Ha! <laughs> I really could eat this whole thing by myself, but I'm willing to share just this time. Gotta add some more sauce to this baby. Time to taste. And I'm going into the center because I want some of that cheese, okay? Um, cheese pull, hello. <laughs> oh my gosh. Mm. <laughs> Seriously? All of the bites together just make it taste like I just went to Chicago, okay? Like I'm just pulling up a slice of that deep dish pizza. It feels like home, almost like a hug almost. Coming up, Jake Cohen is sharing his all-star comfort food, saffron chicken noodle soup. As I like to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This recipe is inspired by the chicken noodle soup that my mother would make for me when I was growing up. I decided to go and add a little unique twist after I got married. My husband's Persian, so I wanted to infuse a comfort food classic with the ultimate Persian ingredient, saffron. 
It adds the most beautiful color and this gorgeous floral essence. The soup really is the perfect marriage of two cultures, both bringing our favorite foods and families together. We are making the most gorgeous broth for our chicken soup, and what that entails is taking some chicken stock. It might seem counterintuitive, but they are two different things. We are going to fortify it with more aromatics, more chicken, and our saffron. To get started, I have an onion, celery stalk, and a carrot, and we're just gonna cut them in half. For our onion, here's the deal. I love to keep the skin on. Skin on is an old school trick for adding a beautiful golden hue to your broth. Once it's chopped, into the pot. Celery stalk, same deal, boom, done. And then a carrot. This is the baseline. Now we're gonna talk herbs. I've got two sprigs of thyme. You could use as much as you want. Thyme is pretty neutral and, and then a bay leaf. Now let's chat saffron. My mother-in-law, all of my husband's aunts, they have a freezer full of it. Why? Because it adds the most gorgeous color and flavor to so many dishes. The key part is, you don't need a lot. It is the most expensive ingredient in the world by weight, but you only need a pinch for every recipe. A little goes a long way. I'm gonna throw this right in. That being said, we are going to add in even more flavor to the stock by simmering a whole chicken in it until it's nice and tender. Bloop. And now for our liquids. Eight cups of chicken stock. We're gonna let this simmer for a while. So if you just did this, you wouldn't have a lot of soup. We need to make sure that this chicken is covered, that everything has enough time to infuse and cook down. So we're gonna cut it with some water. That's always gonna be your trick. You used water to make your stock. Now we're gonna use water to make our broth. Be gentle when you pour. You don't want it splashing on your chicken all over yourself. And now we're just gonna top it with six cups of water. We're gonna bring this up to a simmer and then we're going to let it cook low and slow for about an hour and a half. And meanwhile, you can chill out. I'm in my onesie because that's what my family does. We love a Friday night onesie dinner. And I just think that like, this is the ultimate warm, cozy, cold weather vibes. Put on a movie, binge something on television, really do nothing all day but eat soup and stay in bed. Soup is ready. Turn it off the heat. We're going to pull out our chicken now and strain the stock. You gotta be careful here. We have this nice, beautiful, tender chicken. So tender, the legs already just fell off and that's okay. I'm gonna throw this onto a little sheet pan. Also use a bowl. We just gotta let it cool and then we're gonna shred it. Don't be a hero. You got to let it cool. You will burn your hands. Beautiful. 
I'm going to put this to the side. And intro, our straining vessel. You could use a giant bowl. I'm using another pot. I have a little colander here, which is just going to be the easiest. If you don't have a fine mesh strainer or colander, I recommend using something like cheesecloth to line it. All right, we're going to pour this right in. If you are nervous, you can totally do this in your sink. Oh my God, it smells so good. There's really nothing like a chicken broth facial. I'm telling you more spas need to start doing it. So we have our broth here. It is ready, delicious. I'm gonna season it up in a little bit, but first thing we're gonna do is let our chicken cool, shred the meat, and prep our veg. It's all gonna come together super quickly. And the broth smells so amazing. I'm gonna bring this up to a very light simmer. What we're gonna do is introduce some more vegetables. Fresh vegetables, the reason being, the ones that are in the broth, no flavor. We wanna add some texture, some even more vegetable goodness into this and not have it be mush. I like a little bit of mush, but not too much mush. So we're gonna chop this up, throw it in. So I have two parsnips, three carrots, and three celery stalks. We're just going to chop them up. Parsnips. Can't talk about them enough. I love them. They are a quintessential ingredient to my mother's chicken soup, and I just think they add that perfect earthiness. They pair with chicken so, so beautifully. All right, let's throw them right in. We're gonna let this cook down for about 10 minutes, really just until your vegetables are tender. And meanwhile, let's shred our chicken. It's cooled down. I'm not gonna burn myself again, safety first. And what we're gonna do is we are going to literally just start pulling it apart. The skin will just pull right off. Pull that, okay. Beautiful meat, this is meat we keep. Let's shred it up. I want bite-sized pieces. That's kind of the name of the game. We just talked about that with our vegetables. Same thing with our chicken. The beautiful thing about it being so tender is that it just really falls apart. Herbs are quite triggering for me because if there's one thing that my mother did was get herbs all over the kitchen, everywhere. So definitely keep it together, but dill and parsley, it's crucial. It's that little bit of brightness. I think dill is the most important flavor when it comes to chicken soup, hands down. So we're gonna use a nice big amount of both. It's all going in together, so I'm just gonna go in with my knife, do a nice little rough chop. Let's test the veg first. Mm. That is tender. That is tender, that's what we're talking about all about building flavor. We're gonna throw in our chicken. And our noodles. Six ounces here, and I'm just gonna drop them in. And we're gonna let this simmer for about five minutes, just to let the noodles get nice and al dente. Everything will come together. Let's try our noodles, make sure they're nice and al dente. Mm, perfect. Okay, we're done. Soup's off. Let's finish it up. Put all this hard work. These finishing touches are really what's gonna take it to that next level. The saffron broth, I am telling you, this color, the flavor, the aroma, it's next level. Let's match it with some herbs, some lemon zest, and some more salt and pepper, I'm telling you. I find that a teaspoon of lemon zest, magic. You could also use a little splash of vinegar, but to me, like a little lemon, it's that je ne sais quoi. The color immediately from the herbs, I mean, come on. Look at this. You got the tender noodles, you got the veg, you got the chunks of chicken. Oh, and that saffron broth, I'm telling you, beyond. 
the best part is, is that even though my husband didn't grow up with chicken soup per se as a comfort food, by infusing the saffron, he really has absorbed this in his lexicon of all things cozy. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. Today we're cooking up dishes that can be made in less than 30 minutes. So you can get food on the table fast and still have a delicious dinner on any busy weeknight. I'm making my chipotle lime steak tacos. And I'm making rigatoni with a quick cherry tomato ragu. And I'm making my super crispy cereal crusted fish sticks. I'm Alejandra Ramos. I'm Jay Cohen. I'm Jocelyn Delk Adams. And this is Today Food All Stars. The clock is ticking, so let's get cooking. Tacos are a fantastic weeknight dinner because they're so versatile. You can put just about anything in them. Today, I'm using skirt steak because this cut of meat cooks up quickly. When it comes to tacos, I'm all about the toppings. So I'm also making quick pickled onions and a delicious zesty mayo. Skirt steak is such a great cut of beef. It takes on amazing flavor and it cooks up really quickly, which makes it perfect for these quick 30 minute meals. I'm gonna set this guy aside for a little bit while I start working on the marinade. One of my favorite things whenever I'm marinating skirt steak or any kind of protein is to use a big giant zipped bag. Get the big gallon size and then you can put your marinade, the meat, veggies, anything that you're cooking with right in here. So peel your garlic and instead of chopping or mincing, what we're gonna do is use a grater and just grate it right into our zipped bag. Just kind of get as much of it as you can in there. Now we're gonna do some fresh limes. I always like to make sure that I zest off all this delicious peel. Like 70% of the flavor of citrus lives in that peel and in those natural acids. I love using a juicer like this. It just really gets all that great juice out. All right, this looks so good. It already smells so fresh and flavorful. Now we're gonna add a little bit of salt. We're also gonna add some freshly ground black pepper. And a little bit of oil. You can use vegetable oil or olive oil, whatever you've got. It's gonna go in there. And I promised you chipotle, so it's chipotle time. For this, we're using chipotles in adobo sauce. These are one of my pantry staples. Chipotles are smoked jalapenos, and they're in this wonderful sauce. It's a lot of incredible flavor, perfect for our marinade. And just chop. That's perfect. All right, we're just getting messy. <laughs> All right, so now that we've got our delicious marinade ready to go, we can add the skirt steak. So skirt steak usually comes in this incredibly long piece, which obviously doesn't fit on any pan that I've ever seen. So we wanna cut it down into a few smaller pieces. I like to do about four to six inch pieces. Depending on the size of your pan, you can kind of go smaller or bigger, but that's about the size you want. Just like this. And then these pieces can be dropped right in to our marinade. Now it's time for the fun part. Once you've got the marinade and the steak in the bag, seal it up tight. And then you can use your hands to massage that marinade all around the steak, making sure that every single one of those incredible flavors infuses your meat. Just like that. All right, that's fantastic. Shake it. Now you can just set this aside and let it hang out for about 10 to 15 minutes while we work on our toppings. We're gonna get started with our quick pickled onions. I love this kind of riff on classic pickled onions because it's super easy, super simple, and it adds amazing flavor to our tacos. We're gonna cut off the root side, set that aside, and then just cut it right down the center. Get that peel off. 
To slice the onions, you can use a knife if you prefer, but I love using a mandolin. Just makes everything really quick, easy, and keeps the slices super even. All right, now we have these beautiful slices. I'm gonna put them right into my bowl. And we're gonna do some fresh lime juice and zest right on top. Now we can get the juice. Just cut your lime in half. And get all of that juice in. Now we're gonna add some salt to it. Just sprinkle that all in. This is also gonna help make those onions really nice and tender. I love adding a little bit of cloves to it. I think it adds just a special flavor. So we're just gonna do a little pinch, about an eighth of a teaspoon or so. Then give it a toss, make sure that that salt, the lime zest, the lime juice, and the onions are all evenly incorporated, just like this. And now we will just let this hang out, let those guys get to know each other. It's gonna be wonderful. I think no taco is complete without some sort of delicious, creamy sauce. So for this, we're making essentially a lime crema. We're using mayo as our base, and we're gonna do a half a cup of that. All right, so now we're gonna do two teaspoons of ground cumin. I love that cumin adds this really smoky flavor to it, and it's also very much a common spice used in a lot of Mexican cooking, so it's just something that ties all of the flavors in our dish together. I'm gonna stir that in a little bit and evenly incorporated right into our sauce. I promise you zesty, guys. <laughs> All right, tap that right in. Give it a little stir. And now for the juice. Let's incorporate that. You can actually use a whisk to make sure it's really nice and smooth. All right, I'm also gonna add just a little bit of salt to our sauce. So give that a nice whisk. This is a pretty loose sauce. It's something you can really kind of drizzle over the tacos. Well, our toppings are ready, so now it's time to cook the steak. So the steak has been marinating. It's got all that incredible flavor. And whenever you're cooking steak, you want your pan to be hot so you can get those incredible flavors. So all we have to do now is take it right out of the marinade and straight into the pan. Love that sizzle. <laughs> Anytime you're cooking, you wanna make sure that there's a little bit of room left between everything that's in your pan. Don't crowd them. They need room to stretch out, to get cooking in there. Steak doneness can be a very personal thing. Personally, I like two to three minutes per side, which gives me the perfect medium rare. All right, I'm ready to start pulling these off. Smell amazing. Oh, I love those beautiful grill marks. Anytime you cook steak, you really wanna let it rest before you cut into it. It just gives the juices a little bit of time to settle so that they don't run out. All right, we've got all our ingredients. The steak is just about done resting. I've got a few little finishing touches before we can make our tacos. Now we're gonna work on some of the fun toppings. So I love avocado on my tacos, and you guys already know I love lime, so gotta have a little extra lime too. I'm just gonna slice the lime, and then I'm just gonna quarter it. Now we're gonna cut our avocado. You always wanna get rid of that little stem bit. And then take the avocado right in, go all around that center pit. Give it a twist. Perfect avocado, it's my lucky day. To get that pit, you want to use that sort of bottom part of your knife, slice it in, give it another little twist, and there we go. Pop that out. Now what I like to do is use a spoon just to scoop out that avocado. Perfect. I love a little salty cheese on top. For this I'm using queso fresco, which is a Mexican style fresh cheese. It's a little bit crumbly. I like to use a fork just to break it up like this. I prefer corn tortillas for my tacos. I think it gives it incredible flavor. If you prefer flour, 
go for it. You do you. So you can do this on a cast iron skillet, a nonstick skillet, really any kind of skillet. In the meantime, let's slice that steak. This has had a moment to rest. And now what you want to do is look out for the grain. Your instinct might be to cut with them, but really what you want to do is cut against them so that when you take a bite, the steak sort of falls apart in your mouth. It's just super tender and lovely. So I'm just gonna start assembling. I like to start off with the sauce. Just spread a little bit right in the center. And then a few pieces of steak, about three or four. You don't wanna get too, too wild. I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of avocado. Some of those fantastic pickled onions and that perfect little salty queso fresco right on top. A few little fresh cilantro leaves, just as a finishing touch. And there you have it, chipotle lime steak tacos. I'm ready for a bite. I love it. You can see that steak, the pickled onions, cilantro, that salty queso fresco. So good. Coming up, Jake Cohen is whipping up pasta with a quick cherry tomato ragu. This dish is something I started making over the summer. You know, when you want to avoid being in front of a hot stove as much as possible, but it's also so perfect during the winter because it's quick, hearty, and cherry tomatoes are one of like the few things that you could still get outside of summer and still be delicious. A warm bowl of pasta, it just always hits the spot. Plus the sauce comes together in one pot, so it's a one pot wonder. My favorite kind of recipe, and I'm telling you, it's gonna be yours too. First thing you want to do, get a pot of water going. You want to start to bring it up, not to a rolling boil yet, but get that going so that once we have our sauce ready, we can drop our pasta and don't have to be waiting for anyone. Now we're just going to do a little bit of chopping. We've got a shallot, some garlic, and then we'll get our kind of herbs done too. So we're just going to give this a quick, fine chop. Doesn't have to be perfect, but you want small pieces because we want this to cook pretty quickly. 30 minutes, clock's ticking. I'm not going to be messing around with you. I like a lot of garlic. I don't know about you, I do think it's personal taste, but I'm using one shallot and six cloves of garlic. Let's say you really love things that are oniony, garlicky, fragrant. Bump it up a little. I'm not your mother. You can use as much or as little as you like. When I'm missing garlic, I just like to go give it a little thin slice, line everything up, and then we'll just run our knife through it a few times. Our shallots and garlic are gonna cook together, so don't go crazy with tons of bowls on your counter. Throw them in together. So it might seem like we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I'm gonna chop up some parsley. That's not gonna go in until the very end of this recipe, but it's the last thing we gotta chop. What I love about this is you just have to do a little bit of aromatics, some herbs to garnish, but that's all you need for your cutting board. That's it, that's 
all you gotta do, I'm just gonna clean up a little bit, kinda get everything together, and we're gonna start cooking the sauce. So this is two pints of cherry tomatoes. Meanwhile, in a Dutch oven pot, we're gonna heat up three tablespoons of olive oil. Let that come up. You're really gonna wanna look for a nice shimmer in the pan to know it's hot. And we're gonna add in one pound of lean ground beef. Cook it down into crumbles, and then we're gonna start adding from there. Lots of flavor until you have the best and quickest cherry tomato ragu you've ever made. We're gonna throw in our beef. You hear that? If you do not hear that sizzle, wasn't hot enough. You wanna be using a wooden spoon, start to break up the beef. We want nice, small crumbles. And we're gonna cook until you no longer see any pink. They're gonna to start to caramelize, get nice and golden. It should only take about six to eight minutes. While this finishes cooking, I'm going to grab a bottle of white wine. We're gonna throw in our garlic and shallot chili flakes. Crushed red pepper. I'm using a half teaspoon. I like a good kick. If you really like a good kick, throw in some more. You are a little afraid of spice? Start with a quarter teaspoon. Really, choose your own adventure when it comes to heat. It's gonna cook down forever once it's covered, so don't worry about your shallots becoming super softened. What I am gonna do is deglaze the pan with a cup of white wine. What does deglaze mean, you might wonder? Um, what this means is we're kind of using some liquid to pull off all of those brown bits that are stuck at the bottom. You work so hard to build up flavor. We're searing the beef, we're adding the garlic, the shallots, the chili flakes. Now that we threw this in, time to add in our tomatoes. We're using these gorgeous cherry tomatoes that are gonna burst. That's like the best part of this. And last but not least, two tablespoons of balsamic vinegar. A little bit of acid, especially when we're dealing with tomatoes, is so important. You have all of the richness from the olive oil and the beef. The balsamic is just going to help balance that out, as well as it does add a little bit of sweetness too when it cooks down. We're gonna toss this up. And now we're gonna add in my favorite ingredients. My favorite ingredients ever, which are salt and pepper really want just something that's gonna help brighten this up. Now that it's nice and incorporated, seasoned, I'm going to throw on a lid and we're gonna let the magic happen. Meanwhile, in the same time that your sauce is gonna to take to cook, we're gonna be able to cook our pasta. How amazing is that? We've got a beautiful pot of water to a boil. I'm gonna add in my salt now. In terms of the type of pasta you can use, Anything you like, really. I love a short pasta, something that's gonna pick up this sauce. This isn't a blended sauce, it's gonna be chunky. So really think of things like orecchiette, penne, rigatoni, which I love, rotini. Any of those options are wonderful. Just a pound of dried pasta. You got it in your pantry. Give it a little zhuzh, just to make sure nothing sticks. And you got 10 minutes to drink the rest of your bottle of wine. I'll see you back here and we're gonna finish up our pasta.
time to check everything and get it all together. Oh my God, like magic, all of our cherry tomatoes popped. Now here's the magic. It doesn't look much like a sauce until you go in with your wooden spoon and you start to stir it up. It starts to break down the tomatoes and really becomes nice and juicy. Gorgeous, and now we're just going to take our pasta and throw it right in. You could drain this in your sink with a colander, but I find it's super easy just to use a spider like this and throw it right in. Giving this a nice gentle stir, and now I'm going to throw in our herbs. We pre-chopped our parsley, but I do have some feelings about basil. You don't need to chop it. I'm a big believer in just tearing it off. We're gonna go for same amount that we used for our parsley, but I'm just going to give it a little tear and drop. And we're just gonna need to taste it for salt and pepper. And of course, make it rain parmesan. The reactions, they're always in real time. All right, we need some more salt and pepper, as I predicted. Would it even be a pasta party without a crazy raining of freshly grated Parmigiano Reggiano? Let's give it a taste. Speechless. I'm telling you, this pasta, it tastes like hours and hours of low and slow cooking, but really it comes together in 30 minutes. You get the beautiful sweetness from the tomatoes, the brightness from the balsamic, the beef ties it all together to make a one pot meal that I'm obsessed with. Coming up, Jocelyn Delk Adams is making cereal crusted fish sticks that are perfect for any busy weeknight. Welcome back, Jocelyn here, and this is my all-star take on a 30-minute meal. Fish is a fantastic protein when you're in a rush because it cooks quickly. So today, I'm whipping up cereal crusted fish sticks. This dish is a childhood favorite that works for kids and adults of all ages. First, let's prep the fish. Today, I'm going to be using some cod, and this is a much milder flavor in terms of fish because sometimes people don't really like that fishy smell and flavor, and so I find that this is like one that pleases everyone in the family, and it's easy to work with as well. So we're gonna start by cutting these into strips, and they can be about an inch, you know, however thick you really want them. I find that like a smaller size is like easier for the kids to enjoy. They can just pick them up with their fingers if they want. And it's really giving off those true fish stick vibes. Now that I've got everything cut up, we're gonna start our dredging process. I'm going to add some flour into our first station. And this is going to help 
our fish sort of adhere to our breading. So we wanna make sure that we have that in the beginning. And then I'm going to add two eggs to the center here. And this is also going to help with adhering to our batter as well. And I'm going to give that a quick whisk. Got broken up and beaten a bit. All right. And then I'm going to work on our cereal breading. This is such a fun part of this recipe. I'm going to add our cornflakes directly into a plastic bag. And you wanna make sure these are the plain ones. Don't get the ones with the sugar on it. Once you have your cornflakes in the plastic bag, you wanna seal it up. Y'all been working hard, right? Let's bang these. I mean, could this not be more fun? You can also put this in a food processor, but I actually would recommend doing this method instead because you don't wanna pulse it and make it too fine. You wanna have different sizes and textures going on, which makes this pretty special. And then I'm going to add in our panko. Mix that in. And then I've got some incredible seasonings that are going to bring this like to another level, y'all. I've got some lemon pepper, and I love that hint of citrus in this that really sort of just brings these fish sticks alive. Got some salt, of course. And then I've got both some cayenne for some heat and some paprika. And if you don't like a lot of heat like me, you can totally omit that. So we're just gonna mix everything together. And once you find that everything is incorporated, it's time to start dredging our fish. I'm going to start by adding one of our fish sticks into the flour mixture. And we want to make sure that we coat this pretty, pretty well. Get in all those nooks and crannies. And then I'm gonna sort of shake it off and then add it directly into our egg mixture. And finally, into our cornflake mixture here. And you can see how it's super crispy and crunchy. So that one's ready to go. So now I'm going to prepare our baking pan. I've got some nonstick baking spray, and I'm just gonna add this to a sheet of parchment. Because we're not frying these, we wanna make sure that we're still giving that authentic, crispy, crunchy fish stick taste. Add that directly to our baking pan and repeat. So now as you're adding these, just make sure that you leave enough space in between so they cook evenly. Now that these are all breaded, we're going to do one final spray with the nonstick cooking spray. These are gonna bake fast. We're gonna bake these at 400 degrees for 12 to 14 minutes. Oh, these are beautiful. Look at how golden and crisp these are. I mean, you can just almost taste that crunch when you first bite into these. And just that golden color. I'm just gonna add a little finishing salt right to the top. Okay, oh, that looks incredible. And because you sprayed these really well, they should just come right off of the pan. And plus it's parchment, so they won't stick. Now I'm ready to bite in. Big old bite here. Mm. Mm. I mean, come on, these are incredible. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like, being brought back to my childhood here, seriously. I could have this for dinner every single day of the week. All of the flavors are popping. Just see how flaky the inside is and that crunch on the outside. And the fish is so flaky and tender inside. This is like seriously the perfect meal to make. And couldn't you believe like how easy it was? I mean, Minimal effort and everyone will love this dish.
Season's greetings from the Today All Day Kitchen. The holidays are all about getting together with friends, family, and of course, enjoying some amazing food. Today, we're whipping up three tasty dishes to make your celebrations extra special this year. I'll show you the secret to making the best latkes you've ever had in your life. And my cheesy spinach gratin is the perfect party side. And my flavorful brisket braised in red wine makes a decadent holiday centerpiece. I'm Alejandra Ramos. I'm Jay Cohen. I'm Jocelyn Delk Adams. And this is Today Food All Stars. Let's get this holiday party started. Even if you don't celebrate Hanukkah, this recipe is a must for any holiday feast. I mean, seriously, who doesn't love crispy fried potatoes? It's traditional to celebrate with greasy foods around Hanukkah because it's the miracle of the eight nights and we celebrate with lots of oil. These latkes are hands down the star of the show. Let's get started with our potatoes and onion. I have two russet potatoes and I'm gonna use about a quarter of this yellow onion. Really, you're looking for a pound of potatoes. And obviously it's not required for the recipe, but ugly Hanukkah sweaters are encouraged. We have to get in on the holiday fun, just like the rest of you. Now we are going to grate. I have a box grater. We're gonna be using the coarse holes. It's a bit of an arm workout, not gonna lie. But listen, we're eating fried foods. We gotta balance this out with a little exercise. I have a bowl here that I've lined with cheesecloth. I'm gonna throw this in. And it's just gonna help us squeeze out all of the liquid because what is the enemy of fried food? Water. That'll make it soggy. And nobody likes soggy latkes. We're going to squeeze out all of the water from this. Really give it a good squeeze. When you think you got it all out, give it one more tug. You see all this here? This would not give you crispy latkes. This would give you sad, limp latkes. Awesome, okay. This is gold right here. Please do not dump this into your sink just yet. We are going to put this to the side and I'm gonna tell you all about why you got to be saving your potato liquid. But we'll get to that in a second. For now, I'm gonna grab another bowl and we're gonna start mixing together our latkes. Little bowl with our ball of potato and onion. And now you don't need a lot more. I'm gonna throw in a quarter cup of matzo meal. You could also use flour. You could use breadcrumbs. I'm gonna crack in two eggs. And two teaspoons of kosher salt. Now we're just gonna to start to mix this all up. It comes together pretty quickly. You get a little messy, but that's kind of the fun of this. That's why I'm wearing my ugliest sweater, of course, because if we had a little latke or grease on it, I'll, I'll live. So I have this bowl of liquid here. I'm gonna walk over to the sink and pour off the liquid. What you're gonna find stuck to the bottom is a thin layer of potato starch. This we're gonna add back into our latkes. It's gonna help bind and make them extra, extra crispy. This is the gold, the secret ingredient for the crispiest latkes. It's gonna add more starch to bind it together and get extra golden in the pan. Voila. It's the weirdest thing. It feels so weird in your fingers, but it's the secret. I'm telling you right now. You're never gonna just throw out that liquid ever again now that you found all of this magic that gets stuck to the bottom of your bowl. We're ready to fry now. I'm going to preheat a cast iron pan. I love cast iron because it's thick. It really helps get a nice golden crust. But we're going to throw in a quarter inch of vegetable oil. This pan's gonna fit three latkes because you need to make sure you give enough space so that when you smash it, they don't all meld together. Uh, but really, no more than four per batch. Nothing is worse than dropping it in and you don't hear any noise. If you don't hear any noise, you're just gonna end up with super greasy latkes. Let's go in. I got my third of a cup scoop. I'm gonna drop all of my scoops first. Gorgeous sound. We love to hear it. And now directly after, you got your spatula, and we're gonna give it a nice old smash. 
it goes pretty quickly. You're really only gonna need about two minutes per side. The key part is at a medium high heat, we want that nice golden color. All right, let's take a look at the other side. Also nice and golden. This is ready to drain. I'm gonna throw this right to a sheet pan lined with paper towels. This is just gonna help get out any excess grease so it stays nice and crispy. All right, let's do this. All right, the latkes are all fried. You wanna have them while they're hot, so I'm gonna grab my platter, and we're gonna start eating them while they're fresh. Okay, time for our latke party. We have our freshly fried latkes, now toppings. We have a lot to talk about. I grew up in an applesauce family, Many are of the belief that sour cream is better. You do you. I think there is no one that is better. It is whatever you love, whatever brings out the most nostalgia from your childhood. Boom. Are you ready for the crunch? Mmm. Brings me right back to standing at the stove while my mom fried latkes. I'm telling you, even though I've taken over latke frying duty, it still brings up that same cozy vibe. This is the ultimate Hanukkah recipe. You need it at your holiday feast. Nothing like a perfect latke. Happy Hanukkah, everyone. I hope you have a crazy night full of tons of perfect crispy latkes. Up next, Jocelyn Delk Adams is making her creamy spinach gratin. This spinach gratin might not be super traditional, but just trust me when I say that it takes any veggie casserole to the next level. This dish has become a family favorite that keeps people coming back for seconds and thirds. To get started, we're going to add some chopped onion. And the thing about this recipe is I have actually quite a bit of garlic. I've got cloves, I've got garlic powder. I mean, can you tell I love garlic? I bet you can. But I just love the flavor that it imparts in a dish and it just, it just gives it so much depth. And I mean, hey, who doesn't love garlic? Okay. All right, so we're gonna melt our butter down. It's starting to melt down now. And we just wanna saute this until it's sort of tender and translucent. About 
four to five minutes or so. And kind of stir occasionally. Get it in all that delicious butter. And now I'm gonna add in our garlic. And this is only going to cook for just maybe 30 seconds. You definitely don't wanna burn garlic. Give that a stir in here. While our garlic is finishing up, we're going to get some flour in here that's actually gonna to start to become a thickener for our gratin and it's gonna bring all of the ingredients together. Sprinkle that right in. All right, so now that our paste has sort of developed here, we are going to add in our liquid. We've got some half and half. I'm gonna pour this in slowly and continue to whisk so all of the ingredients will sort of come together as quickly as possible. I wanna make sure that all of that is just blended super well and nice and incorporated. So now you can start to see that it's thickening up and bubbling, and that's our nice thick sauce that's developing here. And now I'm gonna add in some seasoning. I've got some Italian seasoning that I'm gonna add in. I've got some onion powder and garlic powder that's gonna go in. I've got some nutmeg, which seems a little unexpected because you're thinking, we're not baking pie. Like, what's that doing in there? But I love the incredible flavor that it lends to this. And then I've got some cayenne as well because I like that kick. Y'all know I love some spice. And then I'm just going to mix all of this together. I'm going to add in some softened cream cheese, and I'm gonna start to let that sort of break up into this cream sauce. Oh, y'all. This is what the holidays are all about. Bring on the cheese and all the creaminess and all the lusciousness. So we're just gonna mix this in and let it sort of melt down. And it's important that it's softened because if it's not and it's super cold coming from the refrigerator, this is gonna take a really long time and it's gonna be incredibly hard for it to blend into your sauce. There we go, it's breaking down beautifully. So now we're gonna add in more cheese, right? It's the holidays. We can't play around. We gotta make this super decadent. So we've got two different types of cheeses. I've got some shredded Parmesan and I'm gonna add that right in to our sauce here. And then I also have like an Italian blend of cheeses. You will start to see like this become like a huge mess of cheese and that's exactly what we want folks, okay? So now I'm going to add in the star of the show, some spinach, we gotta add the spinach. So into our mixture this goes. Right, and then we're just going to mix this in to our mixture here with the cheese and get it super duper coated, nice and coated here. And then we're just gonna cook this until it's slightly warmed through because it's gonna go in the oven. So I'm just gonna add a little salt and pepper and taste it and if it's perfect, we're gonna get it ready to bake. And now we are going to assemble this for baking. I have a casserole dish here and you can use, you know, as, as deep as you like or as shallow as you like. It's totally how you want to serve this. And I'm gonna use some nonstick cooking spray and I'm just gonna coat the inside so it's super greased. All right, and then I'm gonna add our spinach directly into here. Oh yeah, that's so good. So good. Okay. So now that I have our spinach in here, I'm just going to add some additional cheese to the top because I clearly haven't added enough cheese here. So we need more cheese. Adding right to the top here. 
So I've got more of our Italian blend along with some shredded Parmesan that I'm adding to the top. And then I'm going to add some panko. So now this is going to bake in the oven at 375 for about 15 to 20 minutes. So this is just absolutely perfect. You can see the golden color on top and you can see all that crunch and deliciousness and you know the spinach and that creaminess below is so worth it. Delicious. Um, I might take another serving. Sorry. Oh my gosh. And this is what the holiday season is all about. I seriously could just serve this and everyone would be happy, okay? It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's incredible. Creamy texture, it's well seasoned and balanced. You've got that hen and nutmeg that I told you about. That's coming through. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. I am definitely getting into the spirit. This flavorful brisket is one of my favorites for entertaining family and friends because it doesn't require much active cooking time at all. All you have to do is combine all of the ingredients and basically let the oven do all that heavy lifting. We're gonna get started by making our spice rub for the brisket and there's a lot of great flavors going into this. We've got smoked paprika, salt, some oregano, and a little heat from chili flakes. It's really simple. All you want to do is a little small bowl and then add your ingredients in. I'm going to do three tablespoons of salt. And this is kosher salt, which is really great for a rub like this. Three tablespoons of smoked Spanish paprika, which if you've been watching the show, you know I love. It's smoky, so flavorful and works really well with that red wine we're gonna be adding later. Now we're gonna do some black pepper, a couple teaspoons of that. Two tablespoons of dried oregano. Just gonna shake that in. Don't worry, we get a little bit extra in. This is totally forgiving. 
And finally, a little bit of heat from those crushed red chili flakes. I'm gonna do half a teaspoon. I'm real generous though, because I like it spicy. Use a fork or a little whisk just to mix it all up. Make sure that all those spices are evenly incorporated in here. You basically want to see like a nice, even distribution of everything that's in the bowl. All right, that looks fantastic. Now we're ready to add it to our brisket. So for the brisket, we're using a five pound cut of meat. You can go a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, whatever works for your party size. And then what we're gonna do is just add all of this onto the meat and rub it on. I want you to start with the fat side down because we're gonna put this all on this side of the meat, then flip it over when it goes into our pan. So we're gonna start like this. Do about half of that and just rub it in, to kind of push it into the meat. Make sure you get it on all the sides. So much good flavor here. I'm smelling that paprika, I'm smelling those fresh herbs. This is really gonna infuse our meat with amazing flavor. And as it cooks, that flavor is just gonna come out. The meat is gonna become so tender. I mean, this is a fantastic dish for entertaining. I'm gonna give it a nice little flip. Put it into the pan with that fat side up, and then I'm gonna go ahead and toss the remaining amount of the rub. Just spread it in. Anything that falls into the pan is perfectly fine. That's just gonna become part of the delicious braising cooking liquid. Beautiful. Amazing. That already smells like a party. This is a braised brisket. And what braising means, it's you're taking a piece of meat or veggies, whatever you're cooking, and cooking it slowly in liquid. So for our liquid for this is gonna be some broth, some red wine, and then we have a few aromatics. I'm doing a couple onions. These are Spanish onions. This is really just about adding a little bit more flavor to our broth, so it's very, very simple. We're really just gonna scatter these pieces around the side of our brisket. So just toss them in, no fancy chopping or cutting needed. Now some garlic, a lot of garlic, that's how I cook. We've got about 12 cloves here. Do as many as you want, you can do more, you can do less. And we're just gonna smash them up a little bit. Basically I wanna open them up so that as they braise, that flavor kinda comes out easily. Use the flat side of my knife and push. There we go, a little crushed right into the pan. And just repeat with the rest of the cloves. And the last one. Perfect. So now we're gonna work on our braising liquid, which is a mixture of broth and wine. I'm gonna go grab that wine. For this, you wanna use a dry red wine. I've got a Spanish Tempranillo here, which is probably one of my favorites. I really always love those Spanish flavors when I'm cooking. So it would be delicious if I poured it into a glass, maybe slightly smaller than this one, uh, and it's gonna be delicious in your food. Pouring all that wine in. We're using the whole bottle. To this, we're also gonna add some tomato paste. Just one whole can of that. It's gonna go right in with the wine. Gonna whisk that in. And I like using tomato paste for this because it's already this really sweet, concentrated flavor. So use a whisk just to kind of gently stir that in. All right, that looks good. And so now we're gonna pour in our braising liquid. I wanna make sure that that rub stays on the meat. So when you pour, just pour along the outside, just like that. I want to make sure those flavors stay on the meat as long as possible. Good. And now we're going to add our broth. And for this, you can use any kind of broth you'd like. I love a really flavorful kind of beef or chicken bone broth. Okay, so this is ready to go into the oven. Before we pop it in, I do want to cover it with some foil. The foil is going to help trap all those delicious flavors and that steam in there, keep things really moist during the long cook time. Okay, so that's covered. Now it's ready to go in the oven. We're going to braise it for five to six hours at 350 degrees. And then while we wait, I'm gonna open up a second bottle of that wine.
This smells amazing. The brisket has been braising for six hours. Let's see how it looks. Ta-da! This is exactly what I was hoping for. You'll see the brisket has shrunken up a little bit. It's very tender. All those flavors are concentrated. And we've got those little garlic cloves that we tossed in. Now they're really, really tender. You wanna grab a fork. And then what we're gonna do is you're just gonna go in and smash them, sort of dissolve them right into that braising liquid. This is gonna add incredible flavor to the sauce. So remember, I told you to cook this fat side up. The reason for that is because as it braises, that fat renders and falls down into the meat, making it extra tender. But there is some of it that does remain even after all this cook time. And what you wanna do is hold onto your pan and then just kind of pull back. You'll see how that fat easily comes right off the meat. You just scoop it up. Now we are ready to shred our brisket. So for this, I'm just gonna use two forks and it's a really, really simple process. You just kind of stick that fork in there and just start pull with the opposite one. See how it shreds beautifully? This is so, so simple. And one of the great things about doing it right in the pan with all this delicious cooking liquid in there is that it is basically kind of mixing itself right into that sauce. All right, this looks so good. So I'm gonna do one quick little taste. Mm. Amazing. I'm gonna add a little bit more salt. All over. And then some black pepper. All right, so before we serve this, I do like to do one little finishing touch. I love the little crispy bits of meat when it cooks on the fire. So what I do is after I shred, pop it under the broiler for just a couple minutes. You're gonna get all those little crispy edges. So delicious. All right, so now we're gonna plate it up. And you can serve this with any sides that you want. I love sweet potatoes because I think that the sweetness of the sweet potatoes works really well with the savory meat. because it's the holidays and I love an accessory, we're gonna add some pomegranate jewels right on top. Look how pretty these look. They just add gorgeous color. And a little bit of fresh cilantro. All right, I'm ready to taste. Mmm. What a perfect meal for our holiday feast. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. Welcome to 